gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you? Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. About 4.30 this morning, I heard a trickle of noise. I thought it was raining. Water was bubbling under my back door. Came through the living room, through the kitchen, out the front door. And when I stepped outside, the whole front was just flooded. There's usually a yard and a doctor's back here. Well, what a mess right now on prime time at 8 p.m. The heaviest rain from Sally now is cleared out of Metro Atlanta and North Georgia. While we have seen some flooding and down trees throughout the day, the situation in central Georgia is much worse. Roads washed out, major flooding in several areas. You can see the extent of damage in Washington County and also Warner Robins. The flooding leaving vehicles stranded, seeping into homes. It is causing so much trouble. The street here, barely passable, depending on what kind of vehicle you have. The bigger danger in Metro Atlanta is falling trees. Two people have been killed in the last 24 hours. A woman, this is so incredibly tragic, walking her dog in unincorporated Snellville this morning when a tree fell on top of her. She could not get up, and the dog has survived, but uh, she did not. Another tragic incident happened last night. A recent college graduate who was killed when a tree fell on his home in southwest Atlanta. He had so much in front of him. Tonight, neighbors are telling 11 Alive's Latasha Givens there have been concerns about these trees on that street for quite a while now. Well, many of the neighbors I talked to say they are very concerned about more trees falling on this block, and I'll show you one reason why. They say that same tree that came crashing down on the house, also part of it fell on this vehicle several weeks ago. He was a great guy. Yeah, we all grew up together. Quintero Freeman is talking about a beloved neighbor who died yesterday after a large tree fell onto his home. Neighbors identify him as Gerald Crawford. They say he graduated college not long ago and loved to barbecue. They say he was a kind man who was often seen sitting on his front porch. We, we see him every day, actually, and I don't know, it just, it's just very sad and it hurts, it really hurts. And they heard him yelling as soon as it fell, they heard him screaming, help. Freeman and several neighbors told 11 Alive falling trees have been a problem on this block of Linda Way for a while now. A couple trees have failed. They say a few months ago, branches from that same tree had fallen, crushing this tan sedan that's parked next to the family's vehicles. His mother did say she called, you know, about the tree, and it was no response. Freeman says not long after that, another tree fell at the end of the block, and she says her family cut down a tree in their front yard over those same concerns. Um, this was actually bigger. So, um, yeah, I think these trees are very old. 
Residents say they're now trying to figure out how to address their tree concerns as they mourn the loss of their neighbor. He'll be missed and never forgotten. And neighbors tell us the spots where some of those trees have fallen. It's hard to determine if they belong to the city of Atlanta or the homeowners. We reached out to Atlanta City Council to find out if they've received complaints that neighbors tell us they have made. The city council says they have not received any of those complaints. We've also reached out to other departments within the city of Atlanta. We'll let you know when we hear back. Look, for those of us who live in the city of Atlanta, and I'm one of them, you know, with a lot of trees on our property, if we want to knock these things down, they look like they're dead. Yeah, you really have to go through hoops with the city to try to be able to bring them down. If you take them down on your own, you're looking at a big, big fine. So it is, uh, it is a difficult dance, and it's one I think all of us certainly think about it, and we try to keep on top of it, but I don't know if that's possible or not. We want to uh, make sure that you know about some of the dangers of surrounding falling trees. A local arborist telling us it only takes about six inches of rain and a little bit of wind to make trees come down. And the type of trees that grow in Georgia are susceptible to falling pines because they have a small root system, of course. And here are three common signs that a tree might be dead or in danger of falling. First, if you see dead or falling branches. The second, missing bark, normally around the trunk of the tree. And then finally, the most alarming sign, if that tree is leaning, you need to address it. You can't fool around with it. It's expensive to get them removed, too. Here's an important question. What happens if a tree does fall from somebody else's property onto yours? Who is responsible? This is another element to all of this. Attorney Thomas Salata says if the other property owner knew the tree could fall, then it's on them. But then you're going to be going to court trying to prove that they knew that it was not uh, very healthy. You could be out of luck. Here goes. If the tree's on your property and it falls on my property and I haven't given you notice that the tree is dead, then I'm responsible for removal and the damage the tree caused falling on my property. Unless the property owner has been given notice that the tree has a propensity to fall, that property owner is not liable if that tree comes down in adverse weather. Atlanta is a city in a forest, as it's been described, Chris, and it gets complicated this time of year and certainly when we see this kind of precipitation. But uh, what are we looking at now? How are things shaping up? Things are improving. You know, we had a peak wind gust today of 39 miles per hour. That was here in Atlanta. Some other places had even higher wind gusts today. And that's why we saw some of those trees coming down. Again, it wasn't widespread tree damage like we've had in Opal and Irma in the past, but still sporadic trees coming down. We had some power outages and unfortunately some of those injuries and deaths from some of those trees that came down a little bit earlier. Things are getting better now, though. We had a couple of lingering showers uh, that were left behind later uh, this afternoon into early evening coming out of Cherokee through Cobb into South Fulton County. Those have all now fallen apart and that's really the last bit of rain here on the back side of this tropical system, which is named Sally, the center of circulation right now over into South Carolina. Uh, on the uh, east side of that circulation, that's where we have these stronger storms throughout the uh, North Carolina coast where they have a tornado watch in effect. So everything is moving out, but uh, it is still leaving behind some moisture here. The roads are still a little bit damp. You can see the, the lights there. This is at uh, 285 and uh, 75 right there at Cobb County. The lights reflecting on that moisture on the ground. Take a look at some of these more impressive totals. We had predicted between three and six inches of rain with some isolated areas picking up more than six. Fayetteville got 6.28 inches. Stone Mountain 6.06. .06. Sandy Springs 5.85 inches. Five and a half in Harbin in the Gwinnett County area close to the Barrow County line. Sonoya picked up more than five inches of rain there too. Well, now that the rain has moved out with Sally, we are finally going to move into a drier pattern. We're going to talk more about that and we're going to let you know about a brand new tropical depression that's in the Gulf of Mexico. We'll, we'll show you that latest oh, track. Man, I, I'm, I don't even want to know about that. I'm going to yeah. close my eyes and cover my ears. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> Best way to keep track of the latest weather updates is not by listening to me, that's for sure. Download the 11 Alive app. You can also upload and share photos. Let us know what the conditions look like near you. The Clayton County Sheriff's Office has now identified the deputy fired for excessive force during a violent arrest caught on camera. Deputy Brandon Myers joined the sheriff's office last year. Joe Hankey has more on Mr. Myers, and for the first time we are hearing from the sheriff's office what version occurred from their perspective. 
Brandon Meyer's personnel file from the Clayton County Sheriff's Office shows he worked as a Savannah police officer for two years, then joined the Clayton County Sheriff's Office as a deputy last November. His file includes no previous discipline or complaints. Cell phone video from last Friday shows two deputies on top of and punching Roderick Walker. Today, the Clayton County Sheriff's Office identified the pair as Brandon Myers and Dakota Riddick. A third deputy holding a woman back identified as Demetrius Valentine. Records confirm Myers was fired Sunday for excessive force and neglect of duty. Deputies booked Walker into the Clayton County Jail for charges of battery and obstructing law enforcement. His attorneys previously described their client as a passenger in a vehicle pulled over for a broken taillight. The attorneys told 11 Alive when a deputy asked for Walker's ID, he began asking questions, and the situation turned physical. An incident report released today gives Riddick's narrative. Riddick describes pulling a driver over for a brake light not working and asking the driver for ID, along with Roderick Walker because he was not wearing a seatbelt in a front seat. Walker refused to identify himself, Riddick wrote, and when he attempted to detain Walker with handcuffs until he was ID'd, Walker ran. The report indicates Myers grabbed Walker, put him on the ground, then Walker hit Riddick in the face, causing him to bleed. Riddick wrote Walker then started running again, was tased, and started hitting and biting the deputies. According to the report, the deputies punched Walker several times, handcuffed him, and then radioed for medical help for Walker. Riddick wrote Walker said he ran because of an outstanding warrant in Fulton County. Walker bonded out of the Clayton County Jail Monday, but was immediately booked into the Fulton County Jail for outstanding warrants. Out of the three deputies, only Meyer was fired, and none have been charged at this point, but the Clayton District Attorney is still investigating the case. And I also requested from the Clayton County Sheriff's Office any body camera or dash camera video of the incident. The Sheriff's Office tells us no such video exists. I asked if that's because cameras were present but not turned on, or if there were no cameras present from the Sheriff's Office. So far, we have not received a response. So this is video of Roderick Walker walking out of the Fulton County Jail. He bonded out of Clayton County earlier this week, then transferred to Fulton, where he also faces charges. His attorney tells us the first order of business is to get medical care for Walker. He suffered uh, numerous injuries if you watch the video. So right now we're going to set him up with the neurologist, have a full battery of MRIs to find out what his medical condition is. We also had the opportunity to ask the attorney about the allegations in the incident report that Walker resisted arrest, but he said he could not address that now. We have not been provided with any copy of any police report. As recently as today, I went to go get a report from Clayton County, so we don't have it. One year after his sister was killed in a hit and run, a man in Metro Atlanta is desperate for help. The one piece of evidence he hopes can crack this case wide open. Don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe, join the conversation in the community section. We have more 11 Alive news right after the break. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
broken man is asking everyone again for help. His sister was killed in a hit and run collision a year ago, and he is sure that someone knows something that might help Atlanta police finally solve the case. This is a man who in the past year has endured tremendous loss. He talked about it with our John Shirk. Somebody he cannot explain any of it, it just hurt bad. as he tries to bear it. Kamau Gant, enduring heartache upon tragedy. A year ago, a hit-and-run driver killed his 28-year-old sister, Rashida Covington, while she was walking on the shoulder of Georgia 400 at Lenox Road. She'd just gotten out of her friend's car after an argument, was trying to get home to safety. Atlanta police found the bumper of the car that struck Rashida, a Honda Accord, gold, maybe about 15 years old, with front-end damage and a damage windshield did anyone who knows that driver notice I mean somebody shot some relative some somebody and after Rashida was killed their mother Beverly Covington in her grief suffered a stroke and four months later she was disoriented we're following some breaking news Beverly Covington walked out of her hospital in Jacksonville onto the interstate and was struck and killed that driver did stop to help I mean I can't even make it up John I mean I just I, I don't know man I mean I lost my sister and my mother the same way in four months. Rashida, who brought life to every party, an accomplished cook who dreamed of opening her own food truck, Beverly, the heart of the family. And all of us asking for somebody just to just come forward and just have some sympathy. So his sister and mother can finally rest. Georgia's COVID-19 cases surpassed another milestone today that gives a glimpse of the read of the virus in our state so far. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have now had more than 300,000 cases reported across the state. Today, we added another 1,800 to that total. Overall, the growth of new cases is slowing down, especially over the course of the past month, but the positivity rate is still above the 5% recommended for reopening. Today, Georgia also reported another 55 COVID deaths. That's much higher than we have seen over the past week. Right now, we're seeing an average of about 36 deaths each day. We keep track of the latest COVID-19 numbers and trends every day. We even break it down county by county. You can find it all in the coronavirus special section on 11alive.com or on the app. Let's take a look at some other top headlines from around Metro Atlanta. For the second week in a row, the jobless claims nationwide are on a decline. The U.S. Labor Department reporting that 860,000 people filed for first-time unemployment benefits last week. That's down 33,000 people from the week prior. And here in Georgia, new claims went down by more than 8,000 people. Our unemployment continues to fall. A new report today showing it dropped to 5.6% for August. It's well below the national rate of 8.4. Atlanta police need help finding three men accused in a shooting in Midtown. These are surveillance video and pictures. Police believe that these men were involved in a shooting on 5th Street on September 11th. Witnesses told police they saw the three men shooting at two other men. Nearby businesses were damaged by the gunfire. All of the men were gone when police arrived. Anybody with information can call Crime Stoppers. We have posted the number on 11alive.com. Following a big-time backlash, including Michael Stipe of REM, the University of Georgia says it will have a spot on campus that students can vote after all. Stegman Coliseum received approval today by state and local officials as an early voting site. The university says the indoor venue large enough to support safe social distancing. The decision comes after UGA was criticized for canceling on campus voting in a lot of different places uh, around the country. As we mentioned, Michael Stipe, the musician, Dan Rather, the former anchorman on Twitter, all of that. The Atlanta dream season is over. After an emotional few months in the WNBA bo in the uh, bubble, head coach Nikki Collin did more than coach basketball. She became an advocate for her players when they faced criticism. Cheryl Freeheim has more. It wasn't pretty, but in the box. The Atlanta Dream are home from Florida earlier than they'd like. I think we were good enough to be playing tonight um, with a chance to go to the semis. But found a cohesiveness inside the WNBA's bubble. Obviously, the stuff that happened with our owner combined with like all the social justice work we wanted to do in the bubble and that forced us to really talk and evaluate you know what our values are the dream narrowly missed the playoffs after a strong finish in Bradenton Florida but most of the headlines seeping out of the bubble were related to the politics of co-owner and senator Kelly Leffler it's the reality is politics are in sports you, you can't say you want them out of sports and then at the same time you know they're going to promote 
you know, Trump helping the Big Ten play. Head coach Nikki Collins supports her players taking a stand in what they believe in, creating a dialogue off the court that in turn improved communication on it. We were dealt uh, one of the most difficult hands in the bubble. Collins had to deal with coaching the players through a public tip with Leffler, who criticized the league's affiliation with Black Lives Matter and the team declining to play after the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. We got the bonus of having um, ownership issues that, that stung a little deeper. And I think my job in that scenario was to really stand side by side with these guys and a servant leader. Even if that meant challenging a U.S. senator. I have to believe that my ownership group understood that I was in a situation where I was, I was working and living alongside our players. Senator Leffler said that she does not plan to sell her shares of the team despite the players' wishes. As for on-the-court performance, the dream has young players. Hopefully they will only get better in the months and years ahead. Our neighbors to the south were hit hard with heavy rain and flooding. The video is from Macon, WMAZ. A man's home surrounded by water like he is perched on a patch of land in the middle of a lake. It's Gilligan's Island, I tell you. They spoke with him about what it was like. You wake up, you look out your front door, and that's what you see. I heard a, a trickle of noise. I thought it was raining. The water was bubbling under my back door. Came through the living room, through the kitchen, out the front door. And when I stepped outside, the whole front was just flooded. I called 911. They had to carry me out the front door to get to some dry land. Well, that is no fun. Mm -hmm. Living on a floodplain, probably, as he is, that is tough stuff. But... Uh, Tomorrow is another day, right? It is, and things are going to be improving. In fact, we're seeing that heavier rain that we were dealing with earlier uh, has now moved out of our area, all thanks to the remnants of Sally pushing into South Carolina. So our heaviest activity was really overnight and early this morning. On the front side, as Sally was kind of moving in, uh, kind of ahead of the storm is when we saw that heavier stuff. And then as it moved through and out of here, we saw that heavier rain move on off to the east. Now, we still had a few lingering showers here left behind where we had a few showers that were in the parts of Cherokee, Cobb, South Fulton. Those have all fallen apart and we're rain free in Atlanta. Still a lot of water, though, left on the road. So be careful out there tonight. The center of circulation now up into the Carolinas, moving a little more quickly up toward the north and east and on the front side of that system. That's where we have that threat for severe weather. Tornado watch here. Even look at a tornado warning right there on the North Carolina coastline. Uh, so there is still the potential for severe weather with that to the east of us, but not for us. In fact, we're a little quieter out here tonight. Here's a live look in Athens. You can see the roads are still wet uh, from some of those showers that went through uh, just a little bit earlier. And Athens is going to take a little longer to dry out because they had the rain that lingered there a little bit longer as it was all moving to the east. We also were dealing with a lot of winds today. We had a 39 mile an hour wind gust earlier today. Now that is also settling down. Athens, you still have 10 mile an hour winds there. Everybody else there, though, around Metro Atlanta is back to the single digits for winds, so not much wind uh, going on right now. 72 degrees is our temperature right now. Uh, we're at 68 in Covington, 70 in Athens, a little warmer in Rome and Dalton. You know, they got up into the 80s today as the sun started breaking through in northwest Georgia. Uh, we're going to see uh, improving weather here tomorrow. I do think we'll get into the lower 80s at 81 degrees after a morning low of 65. Uh, on our scale from 1 to, to 11, where 11 is a perfect day, we're going to go with a nine with a few clouds though that are going to be lingering during the day tomorrow. You can see that moisture as it pulls away. We're going to be clearing out somewhat tonight as far as dry weather, but then in the morning a few clouds mixing in with some sunshine here and there. It's not going to be a crystal clear, bright and sunny day all day, and we will have a few clouds that'll be mixing in there at times. And then on Saturday, we're still going to be dealing with a few clouds. You can see these here early on Saturday morning as thanks to this easterly flow that we're going to be dealing with, but we're not going to have any rain around. Finally, by later in the day on Saturday. Those clouds are going to break up a little bit more and then that leads to a clear day, a mostly sunny day on Sunday with a touch of fall this weekend with some cooler air moving in. Take a look at this. Just as Sally leaves, we have a new tropical depression to watch in the Gulf of Mexico. This is in the southwestern Gulf. It's moving very slowly, and I want to show you this track from the Hurricane Center. I just know that I really think this track is going to be changing a lot. The models are having a really hard time figuring out what the storm is going to do because it doesn't really have any big steering currents with it right now. It does look like it will become a, a tropical storm, and if it does, the next name on the list is Wilfred. That is also the last name on the hurricane list before we go 
to the Greek alphabet. Look at this, the spaghetti models. Yeah, you can see they're kind of having a hard time figuring out where this system is going to go. So we hope those models will start getting more in line over the next few days as the system develops. 81 for a high tomorrow, mix of sun and clouds. Saturday, still some lingering clouds. Highs near 73, though, much cooler. We clear out those Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Look at those morning lows in the 50s, lower 50s Monday and Tuesday morning. That means 40s in the outlying areas, highs in the lower 70s. Back to the upper 70s, though, by Wednesday and Thursday. More to come on Prime Time. Here's in this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11. With less than two months until the presidential election, both campaigns are working overtime to turn out voters. Caitlin Ross talked to two political science professors at Emory about the challenge of getting voters to the polls during the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is impacting every aspect of this election, from in-person voting to canvassing to whether or not people vote in person. Political science experts at Emory University say candidates need to take that into account if they hope to win. If they're not contacting voters, if they think that passive digital ads and advertising is going to be the way that they're going to reach voters, they're going to come up short and they're going to be sorely mistaken. Dr. Andre Gillespie says President Donald Trump and challenger Joe Biden need to motivate their voters now. Turnout is key. So whoever gets the uh, the most uh, you know of their base vote out is probably going to be the side that wins. You know, this is particularly urgent for President Trump because we see that his base seems to be pretty constant. He doesn't seem to be growing his base, but then he's got to make sure that he defends other states on the margins. And so that's part of the reason why the Trump campaign is being so aggressive. But the Biden campaign has to be equally aggressive. Dr. Gillespie studies the trends of voters in Georgia and says in this election more than ever, the changing demographics in the state mean more minority voters will be headed to the polls and the campaigns have to show they care. It's a part showing up in communities. It is demonstrating presence. It is demonstrating empathy and commitment can increase voter turnout. Dr. Gillespie says it seems like both campaigns have been waiting for something to change with the pandemic before swinging into full gear. In our next hour, why she says waiting any longer could be a mistake. Coming up a day after the hurricane hit the Gulf Coast and then the tropical storm moved inland, it is time to clean up and rebuild. Put in some places, water is still rising. 
and not everybody's in the clear. My thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice? Along the Gulf Coast tonight, hundreds of thousands of people starting to clear away debris and they are trying to clean up fine red Mercedes there 24 hours after the storm ripped apart communities from Mississippi through the Florida Panhandle. One of the hardest hit areas was Pensacola and that is where Jay Gray tonight is taking a closer look for us. A day later, the scars from Sally run deep across three states. We've been hit really hard and much more than people were prepared for. Survivors clear away and pile up what the storm left behind damage from violent winds over 100 miles an hour, more than 24 inches of rain and a storm surge of over eight feet. In some areas, that water still rising. We still have people, you know, trapped in high water out there uh, at this late, late date. So we're gonna get some more flat bottom boats in uh, and assist the uh, Army, uh, you know, the, thank God for the National Guard. The saving grace for Wesley Nielsen was this dock. The boat he lives on slammed into it at the height of the storm. He was still on board. Docks started to disintegrate and boats started to hop over their docks. When I started taking out water, that was time to leave. Across Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, more than half a million are without power, with line crews pouring in. They stage outside of the threat of the storm in a safe place, and then they'll come in and they'll stay till every single light is turned back on. But that's going to take some time, just like the recovery here. It just doesn't seem real. I can't believe this is happening. Sally taking so much from so many, but still unable to tear apart or wash away their resolve. We'll pull out of this and uh, another month it'll be all cleaned up and uh, everybody rebuilding and ready for next year. For now though, most just have to keep their focus on the cleanup 
and what comes next. Here in North Georgia, the flooding mostly impacted the morning commute in Atlanta Metro. This is video from Hutchins Road in southeast Atlanta. Some drivers got caught in the flooding and their vehicles are going nowhere for a while. Also off Buford Highway in Brookhaven, Peachtree Creek swollen big time, brimming over into a parking lot. We also saw a lot of fallen trees and one of the biggest dangers for a storm like this. We already know that of the two confirmed deaths because of falling trees, a woman in Snellville and a man in southwest Atlanta. Mara Siriani shows us how widespread the issue was today. APD responded to more and more reports of debris and storm damage all across town. This large tree along Memorial Terrace Southeast blocked some residents as they tried to leave the neighborhood for work. At one point, Georgia Power reported more than 17,000 customers without power. Also during the morning commute in Dunwoody, this tree toppled onto a car in the intersection of Mount Vernon Road and Chambly Dunwoody. The tree yanked power lines down. Thankfully, police say no one was injured. And earlier this morning in the old Fourth Ward neighborhood at a home along Howell Street, this tree caused extensive damage when it fell around 3 o'clock this morning. Thankfully, in this situation, no injuries were reported, but again, you can see that extensive damage. And cleanup crews say be patient. They're working as quickly as possible to respond to each incident. And of course, we had all that rain and the wind with the storm. Peak wind gust today was at 39 miles an hour. And, you know, many areas picked up two, four, even six inches of rain, depending on where you were. Uh, the lower amounts of rain were up in northwest Georgia, and then that picked up the closer you get to the, the Atlanta area. The rain is ending now. There are just a couple of uh, spots where there might be just a few raindrops coming down, but the main rain is out of here. And we had a few showers earlier that were on the east side, kind of that last bit left behind as Sally moves away. The center of the circulation is now into the Carolinas, and it's no longer classified as a tropical system, uh, but Hurricane Center issued its last advisory on this system. It's just the remnants now, but still something that you have to watch, especially there uh, in the areas of North Carolina where they have a tornado watch in effect and even a tornado warning right there close to the North Carolina coastline. Here's a live look at Athens. Roads are still wet from some of the showers that came through just a little bit earlier. Uh, we got up to 75 degrees only for a high today. We should be around 82 for this time of year, but I want you to look at this. This is our precip. That's since midnight, not since all of Sally was uh, moving through. If you count all of that, we had more than four inches of rain from yesterday into today. But Look at this surplus 15.86 inches above where we should be in rainfall for the year. So we can afford to dry out a little bit because we have such a high surplus of rainfall and we are going to dry out as we go through the next few days. We'll talk more about that in a few minutes. The Buckhead Theater joining the growing list of sporting and entertainment venues set to serve as polling locations for the upcoming election. Live Nation announced several of its venues throughout the country will make room for voters to cast their ballots. The company offering the concert venue as an alternative to Fulton County election officials after previous Buckhead polling places could no longer be used. Buckhead Theater joined State Farm Arena as key entertainment venues for hosts, uh, to, for voters. For a full list, you can check out the voter guide on 11alive.com. The struggle to find a coronavirus vaccine has become a central focus in the fight for the White House with President Trump and his team contradicting the head of the CDC on how soon most Americans can expect to have access to a vaccine. NBC's Alice Barr in Washington with the very latest. In a standoff over science, the White House digging in today against CDC Director Robert Redfield, who predicted a coronavirus vaccine won't be widely available for most Americans until the middle of next year. While Dr. Redfield may have a timeline in mind, uh, to my knowledge, he hasn't had intimate discussions with those processes. President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, today suggesting the CDC has been on the sidelines as pharmaceutical companies race to develop a vaccine, echoing the president's surprising remarks yesterday about Redfield, one of his own top health officials. I think he made a mistake when he said that. It's just incorrect information. The Trump administration insisting a vaccine could be announced as early as next month with 100 million doses distributed immediately to frontline workers and the most vulnerable and a goal of 300 million ready to go in January. Democratic running mates Joe Biden and Kamala Harris accusing President Trump of politicizing the vaccine timeline and undermining public trust. He said to the American people it's a hoax. We would have embraced 
fact, we would have listened to the scientists. President Trump also contradicting Director Redfield's assertion that masks might be more effective than a vaccine. And I think there's a lot of problems with masks. No, vaccine is much more effective than the mask. Dr. Redfield later tweeting he believes 100 percent in the importance of a COVID-19 vaccine, noting that for now, masks and social distancing are our best defense. The acting secretary of Homeland Security skips a House hearing defying a subpoena to testify on threats to the United States homeland. Chad Wolf's decision will likely create even more tension between the DHS the and the Democrat-chaired House Committee. Wolf is acting secretary but was recently nominated for the permanent position. HHS says it is department policy to not testify while the nomination is pending. Still to come tonight, construction projects on hold as lumber proves hard to find how the nationwide shortage is impacting homeowners. The vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 1105 News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, that there are people moving from the city to the suburbs. Something to think about. How might a move like this impact them financially? Joining me right now is Ted Jenkins, the CEO of Oxygen Financial. What additional cost, Ted, should you consider if you want to purchase a bigger home in the suburbs? Well, Jeff, generally if you get a bigger house, you have more space to fill, and that means you have to buy more furniture, more artwork, uh, other things like that, and that can be somewhere between five to 10% of your home value. Remember, if you go from 2,000 square feet to 4,000 square feet, you're gonna have additional bills like electricity, gas, that will all be higher, and of course, when you have a bigger house and you have land, Jeff, you may have other bills like landscaping and pest control that you may have not had before in an apartment or a condo. 
but when you talk about Atlanta and you talk about in town versus outside the perimeter, you get these marvelous homes in the suburbs, incredible, you know, wonderful schools, all of that. There is a, a, a great lifestyle to be had. But when it comes down to economics, the escalation of in town and midtown properties as far as homes escalate to a much different tune than what you see in Alpharetta or Roswell or East Cobb. I mean, Jeff, there's no question that over time that urban real estate or real estate inside the perimeter has always far outpaced value-wise the growth of what you would get outside the perimeter. This just happens to be the one year, Jeff, that it's sort of flip-flop where because of COVID, suburban real estate is actually doing a little bit better than urban real estate. In fact, Jeff, recently I saw a townhouse in downtown Alpharetta that was actually priced higher at the same square footage as a home in Chastain Park. You would never see that before. So I think you're seeing an anomaly right now, Jeff, with the coronavirus. Yeah, it is curious to watch indeed as, as far as uh, these issues of people moving to the suburbs that we read about. But truth be told, again, in a place like Atlanta where transportation is problematic. I mean, when you look at the, the transportation issue of trying to get in town or downtown, uh, as opposed to maybe even 30 years ago, it has become very, very difficult. It's the same thoroughfares with a whole uh, lot more people. Well, I think people have to remember, Jeff, that money and time, they're sort of equal to each other. And yes, you may get a bigger house, and yes, you may get it at a cheaper price, but if you were to spend an hour on Georgia 400 or another highway getting into the city, that can cost a lot of money. So you have to factor that into the whole equation if you're going to move to the suburbs. I know I've had people over the years say to me, and I've lived both in town most of the time here in Atlanta, and I've also lived in suburbia for about 13 years, and I'm often asked, well, which did you like best? And Atlanta's an interesting place in this sense. I like them equally. I mean, there, there's so much up of living in the suburbs and so much up of living in town. You know, it just depends. It's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like beef and chicken. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think it's true of many major metropolitan cities. There are advantages of being in the city, of the convenience of restaurants and getting to the theater or the sports stadiums. And in the suburb, you might get more land. You could potentially have public school over private school. All those kinds of issues, I think, go into factors when you think about purchasing a house, especially if you're going to make a big move to the suburbs. So do you like the idea of turning your backyard shed into an office? Is that a good idea? I'll tell you what, I actually think it could be one of the greatest investments right now, especially if you're going to be at home part time or full time, Jeff. You know, it's cheaper than doing a full home renovation because entry level models will start at $10,500 to $12,000. And more importantly, Jeff, you still have to perform at your job if you're going to be working part time or full time from home. And to do that, you might need a place of quiet where you can actually perform at your job. And there's a lot of value to having that. You may be walking out your backyard, Jeff, and across the grass and into the shed, but still, it's a place where you can concentrate on your work. Wow, I really love that idea. I'd like to build a shed and then keep my wife and son in the house, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm living in that shed. I, 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 <laughs> Doesn't sound bad. I hope they don't hear that thing. <laughs> All right, Ted Jenkins, thank you as always. We appreciate your insight. All right, thanks, Jeff. It's going to be good weather this weekend and for Jeff to build a she shed for his wife because she's going to want to be outside away from Jeff and his son. I think is the way it's going to be. And you know, the weather's going to dry out. We, we had these showers and heavy rain that came through this time last night, overnight and early this morning, and then it started tapering off today as Sally was moving from Georgia over into the Carolinas. And we, there are just a couple little bits with some light rain still around in some areas, but most of it has pushed off to the east. That's the center of the low right now moving through the Carolinas and it is prompting some stronger storms along the North Carolina coastline. So even though it's not classified as a tropical system anymore, it's still a strong area of low pressure that is causing some uh, some uh, strong storms and even rain over into the Carolinas right now. Here's a live look in Coweta County. The rain has settled down. Streets are drying out a little bit, but we still have some clouds that are trying to break up a little bit out there too. Take a look at the wasometer for tomorrow. We're going to go with a nine. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We start off around 65 in the morning, get up to 81 in the afternoon, so feeling pretty good. We will see a mixture of sunshine and clouds. It's not going to be a bright blue crystal clear day. We'll still have some sunshine mixing in with some of those clouds at times, but 
depending on how much sun we get through these clouds will determine how warm we get. And I do think we'll get into the lower 80s. And then on Saturday, still with this easterly flow, we're going to still have a pretty good coverage of clouds around with some sunshine breaking through at times. I really think it's going to be on Sunday when we see more sun moving through our area. We mentioned earlier the new tropical depression that's down in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the latest track from the Hurricane Center. Kind of just shows this meandering in the Gulf a little bit. I really think this track is going to be changing a lot, but we do think this will become a tropical storm and if it does the next name on the list is Wilford. You can see how the spaghetti model is not really ha having a good handle on this storm. So as we get more data coming in on it, we should be able to fine tune that track a little bit more. Now I mentioned the next name on the list is Wilfred. That is also the last name on the list that is uh, given to us by the National Hurricane Center. So after Wilfred, I'm sure we will have more storms after that. We go to the Greek alphabet. And who knows how far we'll get into that. We've only gone to the Greek alphabet one other time. That was in 2005. That year we had 27 storms. Look at this storm. This is Hurricane Teddy. This is out of the central Atlantic. It is now a category four storm. That is a major hurricane. It most likely is going to stay category three strength at least through Sunday. It'll come close to Bermuda right here. I do think it'll be just to the east of Bermuda and then move on up toward potentially the Canadian coast. We think this is going to stay away from the Atlantic coastline line here uh, for the United States. So take a look at the forecast. I want you to notice a few things here when you see the seven day outlook. We don't have any raindrops in this seven day forecast. We've got some drier air coming in and we're going to feel a touch of fall. Even though we've had cool temperatures the past few days, that's because of it being cloudy, rainy with an east wind. Tomorrow we do get up to 81 degrees and then after that we'll see high temperatures in the 70s as we go through next week. And I also want you to look at these morning lows. Sunday and Monday we're down into the 50s uh, and low 50s here in some spots. And I do think outside the city and the outlying areas we may even see some wake up temperatures that will be in the 40s. Afternoon highs Sunday at 72, 71 Monday, 73 Tuesday. And then those temperatures start warming up a little bit more in the afternoons on Wednesday and Thursday into the upper 70s, but a lot of sunshine, no rain ahead. We have this pattern to dry out now. I really think we deserve it. Stay with us. We have more to come on prime time. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you. We hear you and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. A nationwide lumber shortage driving up prices, putting some projects on hold. Shannon Smith with our sister station in Knoxville at WBIR looks at how this impacts people trying to build or expand their homes right now. New construction can be seen all around the area, from commercial and residential complexes to new single-family homes. I've been doing this 47 years. I've never seen anything quite like to today's market. While home builders like Mike Stevens are thriving with new business, they're having to pause some plans because one big component of building is getting hard and expensive to come by, lumber. We're out of uh, a lot of two sixes. I've got them on order. I've had them on order for months and months, and uh, we just can't can't get them shipped in. Anderson Lumber Company President Steve Coleman said the lumber shortage started at the beginning of the pandemic and business stopped. But as many started to reopen this spring, a lot of lumber mills didn't. First of May, the plants were still closed. So we had business, but we didn't have any product. Coleman said this is just one factor making lumber scarce. A shortage of trucks and drivers and weather events like hurricanes and the California wildfires are also making the supply low and the demand very high, doubling and sometimes tripling the usual prices of popular lumber products. I'm on my 53rd year and uh, it's some of the highest prices I've ever seen. Stevens advises home builders to get their plans drawn up and foundations laid, especially now that interest rates are at an all time low. But if you can, wait a little longer to buy the lumber. And just because the lumber costs more does not mean the value of the house is anymore. So basically, if, if you're not careful, you can exceed the value of the home quickly. And a reality check for the presidential candidates. Next, why two local college professors say it's time to address voting challenges head on. Related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
never gets old when you see these guys having success and regular old day at the golf course for those three guys. Georgia golf coach Chris Hack enjoying seeing the group of three dogs all play well in the opening round of the U.S. Open from Wingfoot. Harris English, Brendan Todd, and Davis Thompson playing together, flirting with the top of the leaderboard. All eyes were on the amateur Thompson early. Three birdies on the front nine. He was not missing any greens. He led at one point this morning, finishes at one under. Pretty darn good. Harris English, a great day for him, currently tied for eighth after firing a 68 along with Brendan Todd. There are seven dogs at the U.S. Open, and that means, Chris Hack says, they can make some noise. So if he's driving it in the fairway and, and giving himself a chance with an iron in his hand, he's probably going to give himself a lot of opportunities. And Brendan's a pretty accurate driver, and Harris has been hitting it pretty well off the tee. So I would imagine both of those guys, uh, along with Davis, all just kind of fed off each other. And that sometimes can help you get into a rhythm with your whole group. Quick look at the dogs' alternate jerseys for the season. The white ones honoring the 40th anniversary of the national championship team from 1980. More on 11alive.com. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. I'm standing in water, water that comes up to my ankle. The tree fell and it cracked and even brought down some power lines with it. There's usually a yard and a wow. back here. Overnight and early today, the so soak soak soil of wh and whipping winds causing trees to topple across the metro, knocking out power and blocking roads. On Peachtree Battle Way, branches brought down power lines and blocked the entire road. We also saw some serious flooding nearby on Wh Woodward Way, where the street looked more like a river and in some spots even like a lake, I would say. And in Monroe County, several roads closed after being washed away. Water cut through the pavement on English Road, leaving a huge section missing. And on North Rivoli, Farms Drive, a similar scene, except with a tree also coming down across that road. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb tracking some of the changes in our forecast. And Chris, I tiptoe lightly into this, but it seems like the worst may be over for us. What it, do you say? You are right. Okay, you don't, good. You don't have to tiptoe anymore. <laughs> you can just start running and jogging because we are jogging into a drier pattern right now. Thank goodness. As you know, we had that really heavy rain this time last night, moving through overnight and early this morning. If you see my phone here on screen, that's because I've got my Facebook Live going as well. We have just under 200 people uh, on right now. We just got started. So if you want to join that conversation and talk a little bit more about the weather, when I get finished here, go to my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb. 11 alive and we'll chat more about this weather. So what's happening is the rain in association with Sally moved through earlier uh, and we had just a few showers around lingering this afternoon and into the evening, but now everything is pretty much is moving out. Our Doppler radar can estimate how much rain has fallen. And remember yesterday we showed you that graphic talking about how in northwest Georgia you wouldn't see as much rain. And then there would be a tight gradient between northwest Georgia and areas to the south where those rainfall rates would really ramp up. Look around metro Atlanta, a lot of areas. Now this is just through the past 24 hours here. A lot of areas picked up one, two inches in some spots and then those higher amounts over to the west of us uh, near Elberton almost six inches of rain fell there and all that rain is starting to move on out right now and we are drying out for the rest of the nighttime hours the heaviest rain in association with what is left of Sally and the Carolinas even still causing some strong storms over along the North Carolina coastline it's no longer considered a tropical system it's just an area of low pressure but still causing some issues into the Carolinas let me show you what we're watching out there this is a live look this is in Coweta County County, where we have um, mainly dry weather conditions, still some clouds that are lingering in parts of Coweta County. Here's a look at some of those other rainfall totals. Now, I just showed you some Doppler radar estimates from our area, uh, it, but these are some actual totals that were coming in from Fayetteville. 6.28 inches of rain. Stone Mountain picked up 6.06 .06 inches of rain. Sandy Springs just under six inches. Five and a half in Harbin. That's up near the Gwinnett Barrow County line in Sonoya, more than five inches. So uh, we did get a good coverage of rain in our area uh, from Sally, but now Sally is out of here. Stay with us. We'll let you know about that drier pattern setting in, but don't take your eyes off of the Gulf of Mexico yet because we have yet another 
tropical depression down there. I'll show you its, it's track coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Chris, thank you. Well, Chris has been working hard and we love to get his updates, but the 11 Live app also makes it easy for you to share your weather photos and videos with us. All you have to do is chat, tap the near me button on the bottom right center corner, bottom right corner rather, then click the orange share with us button, upload your video, fill out the boxes and hit submit. Easy as that. And remember your safety comes first, so only share once you are out of the weather. We have new video tonight of Roderick Walker walking out of the Fulton County Jail. Walker is the man seen on cell phone video beaten by Clayton P County deputies during a traffic stop. He bonded out of Clayton County earlier this week, then transferred to Fulton, where he also faces charges. His attorney tells us the first order of business is to get medical care for Walker. He suffered uh, numerous injuries if you watch the video. So right now we're going to set him up with the neurologist have a full battery of MRIs to find out what his medical condition is. Today, Clayton County identified the sheriff's deputy fired for the excessive force following Walker's arrest. He spent less than a year with the Clayton County Sheriff's Office. Joe Henke has more on his background. Well, this afternoon we received the personnel file from the Clayton County Sheriff's Office for the now fired Deputy Brandon Myers. That record shows no previous discipline or complaints against him while he was with Clayton County. Sheriff's Office records indicate Brandon Myers was fired Sunday for excessive force and neglect of duty. He was one of two deputies captured in cell phone video on top of Roderick Walker punching him. The second deputy was Dakota Riddick. A third deputy holding a woman back identified as Demetrius Valentine. Myers' personnel file shows he was hired as a deputy in Clayton County last November. Previously worked for two years as a Savannah police officer and more than a year in Port Wentworth, Georgia as a firefighter. A Clayton County incident report released today details Riddick pulling over a vehicle last Friday for a broken taillight and a front passenger not wearing a seatbelt. Riddick wrote the passenger was Walker and he refused to identify himself. Riddick says he attempted to detain Walker until he was ID'd and then Walker started to run. The incident report describes Walker fighting off deputies who then tased him. Walker allegedly responding by punching and elbowing the deputies and the deputies punching him in return. Deputies booked Walker into the Clayton County Jail for charges of battery and obstructing law enforcement. He bonded out but was then immediately transferred to Fulton County for an outstanding arrest warrant. Riddick wrote Walker said he ran because of the Fulton County warrant. Only Myers was fired and none of the deputies have been charged. But the Clayton District Attorney is still investigating the case. Joe, we have seen brief cell phone clips of the arrest. Has the Sheriff's Office released any of its own video from this arrest? Body cam or dash cam video? Well, Cheryl, I requested any video of the incident that the Clayton County Sheriff's Office had, whether that's dash camera or body camera footage. They told me no such video exists. I followed up and asked if that's because cameras were present but not turned on or if there were no cameras present from the Sheriff's Office. So far, we have not received a response. As Roderick Walker left the jail today, we had a chance to ask his attorney about allegations Walker resisted arrest, but he said he couldn't address that. We have not been provided with any copy of any police report as recently as today. I went to go get a report from Clayton County, so we don't have it. All right, we now move over to the coronavirus. Georgia's numbers showing improvements bit by bit today. Just over 1,800 new cases reported and hospitalizations trending downward as well. COVID-19 testing is increasing up for a second day in a row, and that is good, but those numbers need to stay consistently high. Uh, that's how we can truly measure our success in curbing the virus. Reveal investigator Andy Parati spoke to a University of Georgia health policy professor who says this is not the time to be taking the foot off the gas. While we are getting closer to flattening the curve, the positivity rates in some counties remain high and climbing. As this graph shows, the number of people getting tested has gradually decreased over the past month or so. So few people, in fact, the state closed a massive testing site near the Atlanta airport last week. Um, this afternoon, I spoke to Dr. David Bradford. He's a health policy expert at the University of Georgia. He says this about the drop in testing. First, people are growing complacent. Second, there's a political motivation to compel people not to get tested to keep the infections down. He's particularly concerned with Clark County, where UGA is located. The number of people testing positive is increasing from a 5.7% positivity rate in early June to nearly twice as high today. This is not the time to be complacent, to take our foot off of the accelerator of ramping up testing, that 
we're about to move into a phase where we would naturally expect this uh, disease become more problematic. As the regular seasonal flu uh, starts to take hold and that further weakens people's uh, immune system, there's every reason to expect that we're going to see increases in COVID rates everywhere. Hall County is also seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases. Nationwide, about 1,000 people continue to die of COVID complications, a number that has largely stayed consistent over the summer. Well, there's no denying it. We have a lot going on this year. Voting during a pandemic presents challenges unlike anything we've ever seen before. Tonight, political scientists are telling Caitlin, Caitlin Ross if candidates want to win, they may need a reality check when it comes to strategy. Political scientists at Emory University say the candidates need to realize that this is the reality of the election. Pandemic, mail-in voting, election lawsuits, they need to take all of that into account if they hope to win. These decisions cannot be held off any longer, cannot be waiting for some change in the course of the pandemic or for county election officials to or state election officials to radically change the way that they're going to run elections. Dr. Bernard Fraga says the presidential candidates need to accept the reality of what voting will look like in 2020 and motivate their base to execute it, whether that means getting out to the polls in person or educating themselves how to send in mail in ballots. Voters have to be empowered to make their choices. Third party and nonprofit groups doing voter registration have been severely hampered by the COVID-19 pandemic. Indeed, many of these groups thought that the pandemic might be over by the end of the summer and are now forced to resort to digital or online activism instead of the more effective in-person registration efforts. He says in-person canvassing and events are much more successful at motivating people to vote for their preferred candidate. And polling that assumed that would happen when the pandemic died down may be misleading now that it's in full swing just months before the election. Despite the fact that Biden is leading in the polls, what I conclude is that there are real danger signs for the campaign. If his supporters are less likely to show up because they weren't registered to vote, because they're afraid of mail-in voting, or just because minority communities have been disproportionately impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, then that support we see in the polls and talk so much about will evaporate when it comes to election day. They say when it comes down to it, whoever can motivate their voters to get to the polls is the candidate who will win the election. Still to come, a sign of the changing times, how a simple sticker is helping businesses let people know all are welcome. And don't forget, we are streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in primetime after the break. Committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Recent data suggests COVID-19 patients who are obese have a high, harder time fighting off the virus, leading to higher rates of hospitalization and death. 
It's concerning news as a new report reveals obesity rates among Americans have spiked over the last decade and they continue to climb. Sarah Doloff has the story. An expanding epidemic in the U.S. A new report revealing the adult obesity rate is now more than 42 percent, the highest it's ever been. Twelve states have an obesity rate of more than 35 well, percent. That's extremely alarming in terms of its medical implications. And that rate likely still climbing, say health experts with the Trust for America's Health, the organization that compiled the report. The pandemic has plunged millions of families into economic and food insecurity and reduced opportunities for physical activity. Obesity is uh, a very serious health condition. Uh, it's not just about how you look or how your clothes fit. It really puts your health at significant risk. While obesity has long been linked to chronic conditions like diabetes, hypertension, and heart disease, emerging evidence ties it to more severe COVID-19 outcomes, including higher rates in hospitalization and mortality. It's truly life and death now, and the number of people who are dying of obesity-related causes has significantly increased with COVID. The report calling for changes, making it easier and more affordable to buy nutritious food, creating more spaces for exercise and play, and increasing federal funding for proven programs. It's important to take personal steps and steps with your own family to reduce that risk, but it's also very important to talk to your elected officials and say to them, we need more help. Reforms to reverse growing rates of obesity, improving the health of millions. Nationally, unemployment claims fell again last week, and which is a hopeful sign. And in Georgia, the number of first-time unemployment claims continue to drop, 8,000 fewer claims. Governor Brian Kemp says job creation is up in Georgia despite the pandemic. He says nearly a third of those jobs are from new projects. Within the last few weeks, Governor Kemp has announced several new enterprises, including HelloFresh, Zenus USA, and Deluxe, each of them bringing hundreds of jobs to Metro Atlanta. And today we learned about another one, Papa John's. The pizza chain just announced it's establishing a new global headquarters in Atlanta, and that means most of its corporate operations will relocate. They are aiming for summer 2021. The Metro is already home to one of Papa John's best known pitchmen and investors. NBA legend Shaquille O'Neal opened a string of nine franchises here last year. Our partner, the Atlanta Business Chronicle, reports the company currently employs roughly 2,500 Georgians. A growing group of Metro Atlanta business owners are committing to be a catalyst for change and unity. It is a lofty and important goal that starts with a simple sign. Here's Cheryl Preheim. Between two neighborhoods, East Lake and Oakhurst, we know all our neighbors around here. When words and works combine, a message gains momentum. We have to think about the community. It's why restaurant owners and friends, Todd Richards and Billy Kramer, are working together on something beyond food. There's always something bigger than, than just us. Breaking bread together always leads to conversation. That is the hope behind a simple sign with a deep and far-reaching message. The quality uh, lives here. To know that everybody is welcome, regardless of their race, uh, their religious background, or their sexual orientation that they know the restaurant that they're entering welcomes them and that all people are equal. As Kramer has been building a burger business, the idea has been brewing for years. Times of division prompted him to challenge others to commit to and openly support greater unity now. One world instead of individuals. Everyone sits down at the table and eats together. That is such a way to have a conversation about equality. And you find out how similar you are compared to how different we are. The world would truly be a better place. And that's why we're joining Billy in his campaign. 14 founding businesses around Atlanta are already part of the Equality Lives Here movement. To bring more people together, that's what it's all about. From East Lake and Oakhurst to Dunwoody, many places in between. This is just the beginning. And hopefully, places far beyond. So my goal is for every business in the world to have one of these decals in their window. What a great idea. Well, they have different decals. Uh, some of them say equality lives here, eats here, shops here, learns here. The decals are free, and we've got a link for you over on 11alive.com. Well, we've been watching the rain today. It was really heavy this time last night, or starting to get heavier this time last night. It got heavy overnight and really heavy 
early this morning with some uh, pretty significant rainfall amounts in some spots. Now everything is tapering off and we've been watching those rain showers lighten up throughout the day and move on out. My phone's still here because we have less than around about 150 people on Facebook Live right now. We're having a nice conversation there. If you want to join it, go to my Facebook page, Chris Holcomb 11 Alive. You can see that moisture as it moves out tonight. We had a few showers around Metro Atlanta late afternoon into the evening. Those fell apart and these are all pulling out thanks to Sally leaving our area, moving into the Carolinas. It's no longer considered a tropical system. Area of low pressure now moving up through the Carolinas, still causing strong storms. Look at that, a tornado watch, even a tornado warning here close to the uh, North Carolina coastline with that storm that developed there. But it's getting a lot quieter for us. Let me show you what we're watching out there right now as we go through the rest of the evening hours. Now, we had rain that was a big deal. We had a pretty significant rainfall amounts that we showed you a little while ago. We also had some strong winds earlier and you can see here that uh, the winds have really started to calm down in Athens we have right now about 10 mile an hour winds. Those are the strongest winds that we're seeing right now. Winds here in Metro Atlanta and everywhere, everywhere else pretty much calm or either three to five miles an hour. Uh, so it is a lot calmer now than what we had earlier today when those winds were really whipping up and we had numerous trees down and power outages in the area too. Tomorrow it's going to be getting better. All right, we're going to still see some clouds mixing in with some sunshine. We're going to go with a nine on the wasometer. That's our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. We start off at 65, get up to 81, and this high temperature is really going to be dependent on how much sun breaks through, and I do think we'll have enough sunshine to get up into those lower 80s. Let me show you the forecast track, that moisture moving out. We will see a few clouds lingering tomorrow, just, you know, mixing with that sunshine, so not a crystal clear day, but some sun. And then an east wind sets up late Friday into Saturday, and what that's going to do is bring us more clouds again on Saturday. So a mix of sun and clouds on Saturday again, and that will bring us some cooler air with highs in the lower 70s on Saturday. But even with those additional clouds, I don't think we'll see much in the form of rain moving through. And then going into Saturday night and into Sunday, that's when those clouds will break up more and we'll see a lot more sunshine during the day on Sunday. Here's a look at our newest tropical depression. All right, we've been tracking this system in the western Gulf of Mexico for a few days. It's really been uh, kind of hard to get organized. Well, now it is a lot more organized and it developed into a tropical depression tonight after seven o'clock winds at 35 miles an hour moving northeast at five miles an hour. This is the track that the Hurricane Center has on this right now, but I really wouldn't be surprised if this track changes because the computer models are having a hard time, you know, getting a handle on where this is going to go. We do think it'll become a tropical storm. And when it does, the next name on the list is Wilfred. Here's a look at those spaghetti models and you can see how, yeah, just kind of going a little bit everywhere. So once this gets a little better organized, we will get a, a better handle on where it's going to go. I mentioned Wilfred is the next name on the list. It's also the last name on the list. This is our Atlantic Hur Hurricane Names list from the National Hurricane Center. Once we get past Wilfred and additional storms develop, we then will go to the Greek alphabet. Then it'll be Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon, and so on. The last time we had to go to the Greek alphabet was in 2005. That year we had 27 named storms. There's another big time storm out there right now, Hurricane Teddy. This is a major category four storm and it's gonna be a big one out in the central Atlantic. May come close to Bermuda uh, between Sunday and Monday, going from a category three to a category two, and then moving up potentially toward the Canadian coast. We don't think that's gonna have any impacts on the uh, U.S. Atlantic coastline. So check out what happens the next few days. 81 degrees for a high temperature on Friday. Uh, and then it gets cooler Saturday, still with a few clouds mixing in with that sunshine. Highs near 72. Check out this dry pattern. No raindrops here on the seven day outlook. We're going to see mostly sunny skies throughout the period. Also check out the cooler air. Highs, I mean low temperatures in the low 50s for Monday and Tuesday. And that means in the outlying areas, we'll even see some 40s around, highs in the low 70s. Then we climb back up to the upper 70s once we get toward the middle and end of the week. Stay with us. We have more to come on Primetime. Sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. 
we are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus-related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. The Atlanta Dream season is over after an emotional few months in the WNBA bubble. Head coach Nikki Collin did more than coach basketball. She became an advocate for her players when they faced criticism for taking a stand on social justice, including from one of the team's owners. Cheryl Preheim has more. It wasn't pretty, but in the box. The Atlanta Dream are home from Florida earlier than they'd like. I think we were good enough to be playing tonight um, with a chance to go to the semis. But found a cohesiveness inside the WNBA's bubble. Obviously the stuff that happened with our owner combined with like all the social justice work we wanted to do in the bubble that forced us to really talk and evaluate, you know, what our values are. The dream narrowly missed the playoffs after a strong finish in Bradenton, Florida. But most of the headlines seeping out of the bubble were related to the politics of co-owner and Senator Kelly Leffler. It's the reality is politics are in sports. You, you can't say you want them out of sports and then at the same time, you know, they're going to promote, you know, Trump helping the Big Ten play. Head coach Nikki Collins supports her players taking a stand in what they believe in, creating a dialogue off the court that in turn improved communication on it. We were dealt uh, one of the most difficult hands in the bubble. Collins had to deal with coaching the players through a public tip with Leffler, who criticized the league's affiliation with Black Lives Matter and the team declining to play after the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. We got the bonus of having um, ownership issues that, that stung a little deeper. And I think my job in that scenario was to really stand side by side with these guys and a servant leader. Even if that meant challenging a U.S. senator. I have to believe that my ownership group understood that I was in a situation where I was, I was working and living alongside our players. Senator Leffler says she does not plan to sell her shares of the team despite the players' wishes. As for the court performance, the Dream has a young core of players and hope to build from there. Coming up a day after Hurricane Sally hit the Gulf Coast, it's time for cleanup and to rebuild. But in some places, water is still rising and not everyone is in the clear. workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only.
We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. Along the Gulf Coast tonight, hundreds of thousands of people are starting to clear away debris and clean up. This is 24 hours after the storm ripped apart communities from Mississippi through the Florida Panhandle. And one of the hardest hit areas was Pensacola, Florida. That's where Jay Gray is tonight with a closer look. A day later, the scars from Sally run deep across three states. We've been hit really hard and much more than people were prepared for. Survivors clear away and pile up what the storm left behind. Damage from violent winds over 100 miles an hour, more than 24 inches of rain, and a storm surge of over eight feet. In some areas, that water still rising. We still have people, you know, trapped in high water out there uh, at this late, late date. So we're going to get some more flat bottom boats in uh, and assist the uh, Army. Uh, you know, the, thank God for the National Guard. The saving grace for Wesley Nielsen was this dock. The boat he lives on slammed into it at the height of the storm. He was still on board. Docks started to disintegrate and boats started to hop over their docks. When I started taking out water, that was time to leave. Across Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, more than half a million are without power, with line crews pouring in. They stage outside of the threat of the storm in a safe place, and then they'll come in and they'll stay till every single light is turned back on. But that's going to take some time, just like the recovery here. It just doesn't seem real. I can't believe this is happening. Sally, taking so much from so many, but still unable to tear apart or wash away their resolve. We'll pull out of this and uh, another month it'll be all cleaned up and uh, everybody rebuilding and ready for next year. For now, though, most just have to keep their focus on the cleanup and what comes next. And we'll have an opportunity to dry out a little bit after all the heavy rain came through our area in association with the remnants of Sally. We had a peak wind gust today of 39 miles an hour. We had more than four inches of rain officially at Hartsfield Jackson from yesterday and into today. And there are some spots around North Georgia that picked up more than six inches of rain. Now everything is moving out and we're starting to dry out a little bit. There are still a few clouds around, uh, but you can see how the system has moved away. We're dry in Atlanta right now, meaning no rain coming down. A lot of the roads are still wet. 
But the area of low pressure, what is left of Sally, no longer classified as a tropical system, but that low is moving up into the Carolinas. Still, even though it's not a tropical system, it's still producing some rain and storms here along the North Carolina coast, South Carolina coast, still getting some of that. But now we have the drier air filtering in coming in now from the north and tomorrow is going to be a, a much better day. Take a look out there right now and this is what we're watching with some of the rain totals that we had here in the metro Atlanta area. 6.28 inches of rain in Fayetteville. Stone Mountain picked up more than six inches. Sandy Springs almost six inches. An inch and a half in the Harbin area close to the Gwinnett and Barrow County line. Sonoya picked up more than five inches. So plenty of rain out there and that caused some flash flooding in some spots too. But things are going to get better. Sally's moving out. We have a cold front that's moving in behind this system, and uh, that's going to help to cool us down as we head into the weekend. We have a touch of fall on the way, even though this week temperatures have been cooler than average. That's because of clouds and rain and an east wind. Well, coming up for the end of the weekend and next week, it's going to be cooler, but at the same time, sunny feeling and looking a little bit like fall. We'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. All right. I like it, Chris. Thank you. Flooded roads and toppled trees and smashed cars across Metro Atlanta. Families and business owners spent the day picking up the pieces from the remnants of Hurricane Sally. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein Peter shows us the hardest hit areas over the last 24 hours. This is a similar scene across parts of Georgia. From down power lines to fallen trees, storm damage leaving a mess behind to clean up Thursday. At least two people were killed. On Thursday morning, a woman walking her dog in Snellville died when a tree fell onto the road, hitting her and injuring her dog. Neighbors are still in shock. Also knew the lady from in passing from her walking her dog, and but uh, it's just a horrible thing. Then a tragic scene on Linda Way in southwest Atlanta yesterday. A downed tree damaged this home and killed a man inside. Neighbors say his name was Gerald Crawford. We see him every day, actually, and I don't know. It just, it's just very sad and it hurts. Then take a look at this scene along Howe Street in Old Fourth Ward. A tree crashed through the roof of a home. Thankfully, police say no one was hurt. Sally's remnants also wrecked havoc during Thursday morning's commute. A massive oak tree fell on top of this car at Chambly Dunwoody Road in Dunwoody. And this street looked more like a river with heavy flooding on Woodward Way in northwest Atlanta. At one point Thursday afternoon, Georgia Power reported more than 28,000 customers were without power across the state. They are asking those still without power to remain patient and understand that crews are working around the clock to restore it. Buckhead Theater joins the growing list of sporting and entertainment venues set to serve as polling locations for the upcoming election. Live Nation announced several of its venues throughout the country will make room for voters to cast their ballots this year. The company offering the concert venue as an alternative to Fulton County election officials after a previous Buckhead polling place could no longer be used. Buckhead Theater joined State Farm Arena as key entertainment venues for to host voters. For a full list, check out the voter guide on 11alive.com. The struggle to find a coronavirus vaccine has become a central focus in the fight for the White House, with the president and his team contradicting the head of the CDC on how soon most Americans can expect to have access to a shot. Alice Barr is in Washington with the latest. In a standoff over science, the White House digging in today against CDC Director Robert Redfield, who predicted a coronavirus vaccine won't be widely available for most Americans until the middle of next year. While Dr. Redfield may have a timeline in mind, uh, to my knowledge, he hasn't had intimate discussions with those processes. President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, today suggesting the CDC has been on the sidelines as pharmaceutical companies race to develop a vaccine, echoing the president's surprising remarks yesterday about Redfield, one of his own top health officials. I think he made a mistake when he said that. It's just 
incorrect information. The Trump administration insisting a vaccine could be announced as early as next month, with 100 million doses distributed immediately to frontline workers and the most vulnerable, and a goal of 300 million ready to go in January. Democratic running mates Joe Biden and Kamala Harris accusing President Trump of politicizing the vaccine timeline and undermining public trust. He said to the American people, it's a hoax. We would have embraced fact. We would have listened to the scientists. President Trump also contradicting Director Redfield's assertion that masks might be more effective than a vaccine. And I think there's a lot of problems with masks. No, vaccine is much more effective than the mask. Dr. Redfield later tweeting he believes 100 percent in the importance of a COVID-19 vaccine, noting that for now, masks and social distancing are our best defense. The acting secretary of Homeland Security skips a House hearing defying a subpoena to testify on threats to the United States homeland. Chad Wolf's decision will likely create even more tension between the DHS and the Democrat chaired House committee. Wolf is acting secretary, but was recently nominated for the permanent position. HHS says it is department policy to not testify while a nomination is pending. The U.S. Attorney General has created quite the firestorm with his controversial comments about lockdowns. Here's Jessica Schneider with more. The Attorney General ramping up his increasingly provocative comments in a speech to a conservative college Wednesday night comparing COVID restrictions to slavery. Putting a national lockdown, stay-at-home orders is like house arrest. It's, the, it's, the, it's, you know, other than slavery, which was a different kind of restraint, this is the greatest intrusion on civil liberties in American history. The highest ranking black American in the House aghast at the comparison. That statement by Mr. Barr was the most ridiculous, tone deaf, god awful things I've ever heard. It is incredible. Uh, the chief law enforcement officer in this country would equate human bondage uh, to expert advice uh, to save lives. Bill Barr used the speech to assert his authority as attorney general and slam the hundreds of DOJ prosecutors working under him. Name one successful organization or institution where the lowest level employee's decisions are deemed sacrosanct. They aren't. There aren't any. Letting the most junior members set the agenda might be a good philosophy for a Montessori preschool, but it is no way to run a federal agency. Barr seemed to be criticizing the decision by several career prosecutors to resign from the Roger Stone case after Barr stepped in to reduce Stone's sentence. All of these matters uh, that are causing so much consternation within the department are matters that seem to touch the president's personal interests or his political interests. That's what's so troubling to these career officials and career officers. The attorney general is increasingly parroting the president. Oh, wait a minute. We just discovered 100,000 ballots. Every, every vote must be counted. Yeah, but we don't know where these freaking votes came from. Hinting at a rigged election without any proof. I don't have empirical evidence that on this scale, uh, you know, these problems were materialized. Barr bashed Democrats on their COVID response. They uh, treat free citizens as babies that, you know, can can't take responsibility for themselves and others. This comes as a source tells CNN the attorney general is frustrated with local prosecutors who are handling riot related crimes across the country and pushing them to explore a rarely used sedition law to federally charge protesters. They're not interested in black lives. They're interested in props. A small number of blacks who were killed by police during uh, conflict with police, usually less than a dozen a year who they can use as props to achieve a much broader political agenda. There's some key things you need to know if you're considering leaving the city for the burbs. When we return, Jeff Hollinger is back with one of our financial gurus to talk about it with Ted Jenkins. 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. 
For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8. There are people moving from the city to the suburbs. Something to think about. How might a move like this impact them financially? Joining me right now is Ted Jenkins, the CEO of Oxygen Financial. What additional cost, Ted, should you consider if you want to purchase a bigger home in the suburbs? Well, Jeff, generally if you get a bigger house, you have more space to fill, and that means you have to buy more furniture, more artwork, uh, other things like that, and that can be somewhere between 5 to 10% of your home value. And remember, if you go from 2,000 square feet to 4,000 square feet, you're going to have additional bills like electricity, gas, that will all be higher, and of course, when you have a bigger house and you have land, Jeff, you may have other bills like landscaping and pest control that you may have not had before in an apartment or a condo. But when you talk about Atlanta and you talk about in town versus outside the perimeter, you get these marvelous homes in the suburbs, incredible, you know, wonderful schools, all of that. There is a, a, a great lifestyle to be had. But when it comes down to economics, the escalation of in town and midtown properties as far as homes escalate to a much different tune than what you see in Alpharetta or Roswell or East Cobb. I mean, Jeff, there's no question that over time that urban real estate or real estate inside the perimeter has always far outpaced value-wise the growth of what you would get outside the perimeter. This just happens to be the one year, Jeff, that it's sort of flip-flop where because of COVID, suburban real estate is actually doing a little bit better than urban real estate. In fact, Jeff, recently I saw a townhouse in downtown Alpharetta that was actually priced higher at the same square footage as a home in Chastain Park. You would never see that before. So I think you're seeing an anomaly right now, Jeff, with the coronavirus. Yeah, it is curious to watch indeed as, as far as uh, these issues of people moving to the suburbs that we read about. But truth be told, again, in a place like Atlanta where transportation is problematic. I mean, when you look at the, the transportation issue of trying to get in town or downtown, uh, as opposed to maybe even 30 years ago, it has become very, very difficult. It's the same thoroughfares with a whole uh, lot more people. Well, I think people have to remember, Jeff, that money and time, they're sort of equal to each other. And 
yes, you may get a bigger house, and yes, you may get it at a cheaper price, but if you were to spend an hour on Georgia 400 or another highway getting into the city, that can cost a lot of money, so you have to factor that into the whole equation if you're going to move to the suburbs. I know I've had people over the years say to me, and I've lived both in town most of the time here in Atlanta, and I've also lived in suburbia for about 13 years, and I'm often asked, well, which did you like best? And Atlanta's an interesting place in this sense. I like them equally. I mean, there, there's so much up of living in the suburbs and so much up of living in town. You know, it just depends. It's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like beef and chicken. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think it's true of many major metropolitan cities. There are advantages of being in the city of the convenience of restaurants and getting to the theater or the sports stadiums. And in the suburb, you might get more land. You could potentially have public school over private school. All those kinds of issues, I think, go into factors when you think about purchasing a house, especially if you're going to make a big move to the suburbs. So do you like the idea of turning your backyard shed into an office? Is that a good idea? I'll tell you what, I actually think it could be one of the greatest investments right now, especially if you're going to be at home part-time or full-time, Jeff. You know, it's cheaper than doing a full home renovation because entry-level models will start at $10,500 to $12,000. And more importantly, Jeff, you still have to perform at your job if you're going to be working part-time or full-time from home. And to do that, you might need a place of quiet where you can actually perform at your job. And there's a lot of value to having that. You may be walking out your backyard, Jeff, and across the grass and into the shed, but still, it's a place where you can concentrate on your work. Wow, I really love that idea. I'd like to build a shed and then keep my wife and son in the house, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm living in that shed. I, 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 <laughs> I, Doesn't sound bad. I hope they don't hear that. Thank you. All right, Ted Jenkin, thank you as always. We appreciate your insight. All right, thanks, Jeff. Well, if you're like Jeff and thinking about building that shed, then you'll want to hear this. A nationwide lumber shortage is driving up prices and putting some projects on hold. Shannon Smith with our sister station in Knoxville looks at how this impacts people trying to build or expand their homes right now. New construction can be seen all around the area, from commercial and residential complexes to new single family homes. I've been doing this 47 years. I've never seen anything quite like to today's market. While home builders like Mike Stevens are thriving with new business, they're having to pause some plans because one big component of building is getting hard and expensive to come by, lumber. We're out of uh, a lot of two sixes. And I've got them on order and had them on order for months and months and uh, we just can't can't get them shipped in. Anderson Lumber Company President Steve Coleman said the lumber shortage started at the beginning of the pandemic and business stopped. But as many started to reopen this spring, a lot of lumber mills didn't. First of May, the plants were still closed. So we had business, but we didn't have any product. Coleman said this is just one factor making lumber scarce. A shortage of trucks and drivers and weather events like hurricanes and the California wildfires are also making the supply low and the demand very high, doubling and sometimes tripling the usual prices of popular lumber products. I'm on my 53rd year and uh, it's some of the highest prices I've ever seen. Stevens advises home builders to get their plans drawn up and foundations laid, especially now that interest rates are at an all time low. But if you can, wait a little longer to buy the lumber. And just because the lumber costs more does not mean the value of the house is anymore. So basically, if, if you're not careful, you can exceed the value of the home quickly. And Well, we're drying out out there after a pretty rainy night last night, early morning, and then during the afternoon today, those rain showers started tapering off. Now, the rain is pretty much gone. We're seeing that push over into the Carolinas. Nothing going on in the city at this hour. And then the rain in association with Sally, and you can kind of see how everything is kind of falling apart a little bit here. And that uh, rotation or, you know, flow that you see right here, that counterclockwise flow, that is what is left of Sally moving into the Carolinas. No longer a tropical system, but it's still a strong low pressure as it moves up to the north. It's causing storms here along the North Carolina coastline, and that's going to keep moving to the north and out into the Atlantic. Meanwhile, left behind this system, we're going to see some drier air moving in, and finally, a pretty nice day in store for us for tomorrow. Here's what we're watching out there right now. This is, uh, I, I thought you might need a reason to smile tonight. You know, after all the rain that we've had around, all the muggy conditions and moisture that we've had. This is our emoji muggy cast, all right? What you look for here, you know, we tend to smile when it's really dry out there and low humidity and then, you know, a little humid. We start to not smile as much when it's humid. We're not too happy and then very humid. 
we may be frowning out there. So right now we do have still some humidity around, but the drying out process is going to continue and it's going to get just a little bit better tomorrow. As far as the humidity, we're going to have a few clouds, some sunshine around, but we're not going to see any rain. All right. Then as we go through the weekend, more dry air is going to start filtering in on Saturday. I think we'll be smiling a little bit more. Still some clouds around, but the humidity levels are going to be lower. It's going to be cooler on Sunday. We'll see more sunshine around. We'll continue smiling into next week too as we enter into that drier pattern. And I'm talking about more than just no rain. I'm talking about the humidity levels that are going to be low too. This is our moisture map. If you like dry air, look for the blue color. All right, where we have the moisture around. That's where we have the yellows, greens, oranges, and then uh, some of the reds here, like what we have up in North Carolina. That's all that moisture in association with what's left of Sally. Well, look what happens tomorrow. The blues start filtering in. We'll have a few clouds around, just a little humidity. That, that sticks with us on Saturday, but then watch into Sunday how the drier air comes on in here, and that's going to be with more sunshine and also some cooler temperatures too, and that sticks with us going into next week. Right now, we have a rain surplus of almost 16 inches for the year, so we can afford to have a few dry days. All right, so you don't have to feel guilty about not having any rain. In fact, take a look at the graph of the humidity levels for the dew points. We're going from these humid levels Thursday and Friday down to the really dry air for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. And as those dew points lower, we're also going to see the temperatures falling as well into the 50s for the mornings as we head into next week. So tomorrow, a nine on the wasometer, 81, a mixture of sunshine and clouds, not worried about rain, less than a 20% chance for a shower. Then on Friday, yeah, on Friday, we'll see that mix of sun and clouds around. Then on Saturday, an east wind comes in. That'll bring us a few more clouds, not as much sun on Saturday, but then by Sunday, those clouds, Saturday night and Sunday, those clouds will break up and on Sunday, we'll see a lot more sunshine. Cooler air too, 73 for a high on Saturday. And then look at the lows, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, lows in the 50s. Even lower 50s Monday and Tuesday. That means we'll have 40s in the outlying areas. Highs in the lower 70s for the first part of the week, then back to the upper 70s by the middle and end of the week. Extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
in times of great uncertainty. Drier air moves in tomorrow. We get up to about 81 degrees with some sunshine mixing in with the clouds. A few more clouds and cooler on Saturday, but no rain around. We'll see more sunshine, mostly sunny skies. Really cool mornings for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday with temperatures in the 50s and then highs in the 70s. Well, Chris, I think you deserve a 10 just as much as those 10s on the Wazama there for all the work that you've been doing guiding us through Hurricane Sally. We'll see you in 10 minutes for more prime time. In their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. The impact of Sally's wind and rain seen across Metro Atlanta. A look at some of the hardest areas going up. Plus, why UGA quickly changed its decision about allowing in-person voting on campus. But first tonight at 10, the attorneys for the man seen on video beaten by Clayton County deputies plan to address the public tomorrow. Roger Walker is now out on bond. And this comes after Walker's attorneys spent the last week fighting to get him out of jail. 11 Alive's Shanu Her joins us live now with details of Mr. Walker's release. Yeah, Roderick Walker's attorneys say as part of that bond, he'll have to wear an ankle monitor even though he's out of jail. With lawyers by his side, Roderick Walker walked out of the Fulton County Jail on bond Thursday afternoon, almost a week after this viral video of now fired Clayton County deputy Brandon Myers was seen repeatedly punching Walker in the face while another deputy had Walker pinned. 
Walker's attorney, Taurus Butterfield, says the first task to take care of, getting Walker to a doctor. Uh, he suffered uh, numerous injuries if you watch the video, so right now we're going to set him up with the neurologist, have a full battery of MRIs to find out what his medical condition is. Also on Thursday, the Clayton County Sheriff's Office released the names of the three deputies involved in the arrest. Sheriff Victor Hill fired Myers on Sunday for excessive force and neglect of duty. The second deputy seen pinning Walker down was Dakota Riddick. A third deputy seen on video is Demetrius Valentine. In an incident report the Clayton County Sheriff's Office released, it says Riddick pulled over a car last Friday in Clayton County on Phoenix Boulevard for a broken taillight and the front passenger was not wearing a seatbelt. Riddick wrote that passenger was Walker and he refused to identify himself. Riddick says he tried to detain Walker until he was ID'd, then Walker started to run. The report also states Walker was fighting off the deputies who then tased him. Walker is accused of punching and elbowing deputies in response. The deputies punched Walker in return. When asked about those allegations in the report, Butterfield denied knowing those details. We have not been provided with any copy of any police report. As recently as today, I went to go get a report from Clayton County, so we don't have it. Yeah, so earlier today I reached out to the Savannah Police Department. They told me uh, Myers used to work for that department from 2017 until 2019, and there he was last in the patrol division. Now, we did also reach out to the Clayton County Sheriff's Office about dash cam video as well as body cam video, and they told us both do not exist. Now, Walker's attorneys tell us they do plan to address this further tomorrow. All right, Janu Her, thank you. Well, the worst is over, but Hurricane Sally left quite a mess behind. Flooded roads, toppled trees, and smashed cars across metro Atlanta. Families and business owners spent the day picking up the pieces from the remnants of Sally. 11 Alive's Brittany Klein-Peters shows us the hardest hit areas over the last 24 hours. This is a similar scene across parts of Georgia. From down power lines to fallen trees, storm damage leaving a mess behind to clean up Thursday. At least two people were killed. On Thursday morning, a woman walking her dog in Snellville died when a tree fell onto the road, hitting her and injuring her dog. Neighbors are still in shock. Also knew the lady from in passing from her walking her dog, and but uh, it's just a horrible thing. Then a tragic scene on Linda Way in southwest Atlanta yesterday. A downed tree damaged this home and killed a man inside. Neighbors say his name was Gerald Crawford. We see him every day, actually, and I don't know. It just, it's just very sad and it hurts. Then take a look at this scene along Howe Street in Old Fourth Ward. A tree crashed through the roof of a home. Thankfully, police say no one was hurt. Sally's remnants also wrecked havoc during Thursday morning's commute. A massive oak tree fell on top of this car at Chambly Dunwoody Road in Dunwoody. And this street looked more like a river with heavy flooding on Woodward Way in northwest Atlanta. At one point Thursday afternoon, Georgia Power reported more than 28,000 customers were without power across the state. They are asking those still without power to remain patient and understand that crews are working around the clock to restore it. All right, Brittany, thank you. We are expecting calmer weather as the weekend approaches. You know, that's really good. I was on uh, my hands and my feet today vacuuming water out of no. my basement. I'm I'm looking forward to a drier weekend. Oh, uh, well, you'll have an opportunity <laughs> to dry out as you go through the next few days. And that drying out process is happening right now as all that moisture from Sally moving away from our area. Uh, dry weather out there right now. If we had a few showers late afternoon into evening that were lingering around. But now that Sally has moved on out uh, into the Carolinas, it's no longer a tropical system. It's an area of low pressure now that's moving up through South Carolina, North Carolina, and still producing some some storms here, especially a, a tropical, actually a tornado watch there for parts of the North Carolina coastline with some of the storms that have been developing there. It's going to continue moving to the north and east, moving away from us. And as it does, the drier air is going to be filter in, filtering in. Take a look at some of these impressive rain totals that we had throughout the storm in the metro area. Fayetteville, more than six and a quarter inches of rain. Stone Mountain had over six inches, almost six inches in Sandy Springs. Harbin there at the Gwinnett and Barrow County line, 
also had almost six inches, about five and a half there. And Sonoya, uh, down toward Coweta County, had more than five inches of rain that fell there, too. Our winds also dying down. We had a peak wind gust today of 39 miles an hour. Now everything is much calmer. Last hour in Athens, we had 10 mile an hour winds. That's now settled down to se seven, six mile an hour winds in Marietta. Everybody right now, less than 10 mile an hour winds. So that's a good thing that those are settling down. Stay with us. We are entering into a drier pattern. We'll talk about that. Plus, we're gonna show you the brand new tropical depression, a new one. The hits keep coming, folks. We have another one in the <laughs> Gulf of Mexico. More on that coming up. And the hits keep on coming on the 11 Alive app. You can upload, share your photos. Let us know what the conditions look around you. It's a good app. Really good stuff. Download it. You'll be grateful. New tonight, a 911 supervisor in Roswell demoted, then fired. It's all over what the chief calls a racially charged, and that's a quote, post on social media. 11 Alive's Reveal Investigations got their hands on the police department's internal documents and the audio of the fired officer then quickly defending herself. Here is John Shirick. It was in June when some Roswell 911 communications officers first saw it. One of the Facebook posts that their supervisor, Rhonda Moore, shared on her personal page. It shows the Confederate flag with the words, if this symbol represents racism in America, so do these. And below that, the post shows logos for black and Hispanic organizations and causes. Were Rhonda Moore's racially oriented posts violating the city's policies on social media use? Moore told investigators her posts express what she believes. As far as the rebel flag this doesn't stand for racism and as far as the blm and all that that's an organized group that is out to do nothing but cause issues with the law enforcement and with the public two black 911 officers told investigators that they had never before seen that side of more in shock that she would post something like that a lot of people look at ronda as like the mom of the shift chief james conroy decided to demote more writing her quote the posts on your personal social media pages contain racially charged materials these images are not acceptable more appealed and last friday city administrator gary palmer fired more more insisting she did not mean to offend anyone we can't say that we're white pride or whatever you want to call it because we could be deemed as racist and I don't agree with that. Moore tells me she's consulting with an attorney about what her options are now. John Sherrick reporting for us tonight. Well, Atlanta police need help finding three men accused in a shooting in Midtown. These are surveillance video and pictures uh, showing the men police believe were involved in the shooting on 5th Street back on September 11th. Witnesses told police they saw three men shooting at two other men. Nearby businesses were damaged by that gunfire. All of the men were gone when police arrived on scene. Anyone with information can call Crime Stoppers, and we've also posted that number on 11alive.com. COVID-19 testing increasing up for a second day in a row. That's good, but those numbers need to stay consistently high. That's how experts measure the success in curbing the virus. Reveal investigator Andy Parati spoke to a University of Georgia health policy professor who says this is not the time to take your foot off the gas. While we are getting closer to flattening the curve, the positivity rates in some counties remain high and climbing. As this graph shows, the number of people getting tested has gradually decreased over the past month or so. So few people, in fact, the state closed a massive testing site near the Atlanta airport last week. Um, this afternoon, I spoke to Dr. David Bradford. He's a health policy expert at the University of Georgia. He says this about the drop in testing. First, people are growing complacent. Second, there's a political motivation to compel people not to get tested to keep the infections down. He's particularly concerned with Clark County, where UGA is located. The number of people testing positive is increasing from a 5.7% positivity rate in early June to nearly twice as high today. This is not the time to be complacent to take our foot off of the accelerator of ramping up testing, that we're about to move into a phase where we would naturally expect this uh, disease become more problematic as the regular seasonal flu uh, starts to take hold and that further weakens people's uh, immune system. There's every reason to expect that we're going to see increases in COVID rates everywhere. Hall County is also seeing a surge in COVID-19 cases. Nationwide, about a thousand people continue to die of COVID complications, a number that has largely stayed consistent over the summer. 
A number not staying consistent. The national unemployment claims that are falling again last week, which is a hopeful sign. And in Georgia, the number of first time unemployment claims continue to drop 8,000 claims fewer. Uh, Governor Brian Kemp says job creation is up in Georgia despite the pandemic. He says nearly a third of those jobs are from new projects. Within the last few weeks, Governor Kemp has announced several new enterprises, including HelloFresh, Zinus USA, Deluxe, each bringing hundreds of jobs to Metro Atlanta. It could be a challenge getting voters to the polls, too, uh, amid the pandemic. So there's much to talk about on this front, not only about the economy, but certainly about politics and to talk about the pandemic. So much, and we will continue right after this break. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or? Following backlash, the University of Georgia says it will have a spot on campus where students can vote after all. Stegman Coliseum receiving approval today by state and local officials as an early voting site. The university says the indoor venue is large enough to support safe social distancing. The decision comes after UGA was criticized for canceling on-campus voting at the Tate Center. With less than two months until the presidential election, both campaigns now are working overtime to try and turn out voters. Well, Caitlin Ross spoke to two political science professors at Emory University about the challenge to get voters to the polls during the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic is impacting every aspect of this election, from in-person voting to canvassing to whether or not people vote in person. Political science experts at Emory University say candidates need to take that into account if they hope to win. If they're not contacting voters, if they think that passive digital ads and advertising is going to be the way that they're going to reach voters, they're going to come up short and they're going to be sorely mistaken. Dr. Andra Gillespie says President Donald Trump and challenger Joe Biden need to motivate their voters now. Turnout is key. So whoever gets the uh, the most uh, you know of their base vote out is probably going to be the side that wins. You know, this is particularly urgent for President Trump because we see that his base seems to be pretty constant. He doesn't seem to be growing his base, but then he's got to make sure that he defends other states on the margins. And so that's part of the reason why the Trump campaign is being so aggressive. But the Biden campaign has to be equally aggressive. Dr. Gillespie studies the trends of voters in Georgia and says in this election more than ever, the changing demographics in the state mean more minority voters will be headed to the polls and the campaigns have to show they care. It's a part showing up in communities. It is demonstrating presence. It is demonstrating empathy and commitment can increase voter turnout. Dr. Gillespie says it seems like both campaigns were waiting for something to change with the pandemic before swinging into full gear. Coming up at six, why she thinks that would be a mistake. 
Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb now joins us again with the seven day forecast. We are on Friday Eve, as we like to call Thursday. So we <laughs> focus in on the weekend, Chris, to make sure that we are going to have a pleasant time indeed on Saturday and Sunday. Oh, and it, it's going to be nice. We're going to be drying out. It's not going to be pure sunshine on Saturday. We're going to have a pretty good coverage of clouds. We'll have cool air around, but then Sunday we'll have a lot more sunshine and we're going to have a taste of fall coming up this weekend and even into next week too with some cooler air moving in and that's thanks to Sally getting out of here and uh, a weak cold front that's going to move our way that'll spill in just some of that cooler air that we're going to be experiencing. We don't have any rain in our area now. We're dry in Metro Atlanta. All the rain is moving out along with that area of low pressure that used to be Sally. It's no longer a tropical system. It's just a low pressure area moving up into the Carolinas now and even though it's no longer tropical, it's still uh, causing some uh, storms along the North Carolina coastline. That's where we have a tornado watch in effect. We did have a couple of tornado warnings earlier in some of those storms that had a little bit of rotation with them, but now we're getting the drier air that's starting to move in, and that's good news as we finish up the week here and head into the weekend. Here's what we're watching out there at this hour where we have temperatures that have been uh, pretty comfortable today. We got up into uh, the 70s right at 75 degrees. Tomorrow it's going to be a little warmer. High temperatures get up to 81 degrees in the afternoon. Afternoon. We will have a mixture of sunshine and clouds during the day. Lows in the morning start off at 65 and it's all going to depend on how much sunshine we have tomorrow to determine exactly how warm it gets tomorrow. I'm going with 81. Some models are saying upper 70s. Others are saying 83 and 84 degrees. Now here's what we're watching tonight. As Sally moves out, it's taking that moisture with it. We're still going to have some clouds lingering behind, but we will see some sunshine tomorrow mixing in with those clouds and it's going to be a pretty nice day. And again, warming up into the lower 80s, not concerned about a big time rain chance. I'm really going with a less than 20% chance for a shower. Once we get into Saturday, though, we have an east wind that's developing here again that will help to feed in a few more clouds and we will have cool temperatures on Saturday too in the lower 70s not as much sunshine around but once we get into Saturday night and then into Sunday these clouds are going to break up a little bit more and we will see more sunshine on Sunday and continue with that mostly sunny sky into a big part of next week with those cooler temperatures now Sally's moving out but guess what? We have another system that we have to watch. This is a brand new tropical depression in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. We've been watching this for a few days, but it's been very disorganized. Well, now it has gotten a lot more organized. It's officially a tropical depression. If it becomes a tropical storm, the next name on the list is Wilfred. And we do think it'll become a tropical storm, most likely uh, Friday into Saturday. Now, when you look at this track, you know, it just drifts up to the north and then it turns back to the west. I really think this track is going to be updated many times before we have a landfall. The models are just having a really hard time figuring out what's going to happen with this system. And once it gets a little more developed and establishes more of a movement with it, we'll be able to see where it's going to go. As you can see, the spaghetti models aren't really you know, helping out that much right now. And as I mentioned, Wilford, the next name on the list, also the last name on the list. If when we get past Wilford, which we think we will, then we go to the Greek alphabet, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and on and on. Hopefully we won't get too far into that uh, Greek alphabet. Seven day forecast showing for dry weather tomorrow, mix of sun and clouds, high of 81. Still some clouds around Saturday and cooler, 72 for a high. Then we'll be um, nice and cool Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, mostly sunny skies, lows in the 50s, highs in the lower 70s, Sunday and Monday and Tuesday, back to the upper 70s on Wednesday and Thursday. Here is your weather wow moment. This is video from near Mobile, Alabama during the storm yesterday. Just look at that. The strong winds from Sally uh, getting a hold of this high, high profile vehicle, that tractor trailer truck tipped it over. The driver wasn't injured, but that is just crazy video to see. And that's just how strong those winds were. Uh, we'd love to see your weather wow moment. A lot of times we get the local ones from our 11 Alive Community Storm Trackers. You can be a part of that group on Facebook. Just ask to become a member there. Search 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Ask to become a member of that group. We'll let you in. You can see what folks are sharing from their neighborhood and you can share your weather information, pictures and videos there too. Still to come, a sign of the changing times, how a simple sticker is helping businesses let people know all are welcome. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today.
In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. A growing number of Metro Atlanta business owners are committed to being a catalyst for change and unity. It's a lofty goal, but it is important that starts with a simple sign. Cheryl Preheim has more. Between two neighborhoods, East Lake and Oakhurst, we know all our neighbors around here. When words and works combine, a message gains momentum. We have to think about the community. It's why restaurant owners and friends, Todd Richards and Billy Kramer, are working together on something beyond food. There's always something bigger than, than just us. Breaking bread together always leads to conversations. That is the hope behind a simple sign with a deep and far-reaching message. The quality uh, lives here. To know that everybody is welcome, regardless of their race, uh, their religious background or their sexual orientation, that they know the restaurant that they're entering welcomes them and that all people are equal. As Kramer has been building a burger business, the idea has been brewing for years. Times of division prompted him to challenge others to commit to and openly support greater unity now. One world instead of individuals. Everyone sits down at the table and eats together. That is such a way to have a conversation about equality. And you find out how similar you are compared to how different we are. The world would truly be a better place. And that's why we're joining Billy in his campaign. 14 founding businesses around Atlanta are already part of the Equality Lives Here movement. To bring more people together, that's what it's all about. From East Lake and Oakhurst to Dunwoody, many places in between. This is just the beginning. And hopefully, places far beyond. So my goal is for every business in the world to have one of these decals in their window. And they have different decals. Uh, one says equality lives here, another eats here, uh, shops here, learns here. The decals are free and we've got a link for you on 11alive.com. You know, Jeff, I, I love the idea of this, but I also feel sad and disappointed that we have to express that in places, that equality lives there, that it should just be something that we should all be able to do freely. Well, the upside of the summer into the fall has been that we are all aware of these things. Now, mm -hmm. thinking about them, talking about them publicly, which is something we should have done a long time ago. So, yeah, you know. absolutely. Yep. All right, well, I will catch up with you in about 30 minutes when we are over on 11 Alive for Uplate. Great. Save my seat. Will I you? will. I'll keep it warm <laughs> for you. Oh, no, I, you know, I can do that. I'm, I need to be exercising. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, here's what's coming up on the Big 36, where news is king. Construction projects on hold as lumber proves to be hard to find. How the nationwide shortage is impacting homeowners. Of slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station.
today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov slash COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. The struggle to find a coronavirus vaccine has become a central focus in the fight for the White House. President Trump and his team are contradicting the head of the CDC on how soon most Americans can expect to have access. Here's NBC's Alice Barr in Washington with the very latest. In a standoff over science, the White House digging in today against CDC Director Robert Redfield, who predicted a coronavirus vaccine won't be widely available for most Americans until the middle of next year. While Dr. Redfield may have a timeline in mind, uh, to my knowledge, he hasn't had intimate discussions with those processes. President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, today suggesting the CDC has been on the sidelines as pharmaceutical companies race to develop a vaccine, echoing the president's surprising remarks yesterday about Redfield, one of his own top health officials. I think he made a mistake when he said that. It's just incorrect information. The Trump administration insisting a vaccine could be announced as early as next month with 100 million doses distributed immediately to frontline workers and the most vulnerable and a goal of 300 million ready to go in January. Democratic running mates Joe Biden and Kamala Harris accusing President Trump of politicizing the vaccine timeline and undermining public trust. A new NBC News survey monkey poll found just 26 percent trust what the president has said about a vaccine. Biden on Twitter accusing the president of a track record of incompetence and dishonesty on testing masks and social distancing. 
President Trump also contradicting Director Redfield's assertion that masks might be more effective than a vaccine. And I think there's a lot of problems with masks. No, vaccine is much more effective than the mask. Dr. Redfield later tweeting he believes 100 percent in the importance of a COVID-19 vaccine, noting that for now, masks and social distancing are our best defense. And a reminder from health officials to get your flu shot today, NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres gave new details about the low number of flu cases that we are seeing around the world, and that's why it is going on right now. Social distancing and other COVID precautions may be keeping flu cases down. Now, the CDC reports today that flu cases around the world have been lower, and this could be caused by all the public health measures that we've been following during the coronavirus pandemic. As a matter of fact, flu data reported from Australia, South America, and South Africa show very low flu activity during June through August, the typical Southern Hemisphere influenza season. As we start to enter our typical flu season here in the U.S., it's more important than ever that we get the flu shot to protect ourselves and the people around us from getting the flu. Because we have no idea if it'll be a lighter season like Australia is seeing or if it will be a bad flu year for us. So you should get the flu vaccine before flu viruses start spreading in your community. It does take about two weeks for the shot to kick in and for antibodies to develop. So plan to get the vaccine in early fall before the flu season begins. And by getting your flu shot and continuing to follow the same COVID countermeasures, you're helping reduce the strain on hospitals that are responding to the pandemic and doing your part to prevent a twindemic of COVID and a bad flu season. Now, we're learning more about this virus every minute. So tune in to learn more tonight on NBC Nightly News. Well, it's a little late for that, but uh, you're tuning in to us right here. We got you covered. If you're wondering when to get your flu shot, one of our local infectious disease experts has some advice. Emory Dr. Carlos Del Rio gets his in mid to late October. He says that helps it last through most of the flu season and to get the most out of that shot. Patients have so many reasons to thank nurses always, but we are especially aware of that now, and they care for patients beyond the medical needs. And that includes now helping them to vote. Here's NBC's Joe Fryer. On top of helping to deliver babies, two OB nurses are helping to deliver votes. You need to register to vote. Their efforts go beyond this voter registration drive at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York. Lisa Chavron and Aaron Smith created a program to help patients vote, even though they're suddenly stuck in a hospital bed. Voting is really important to us because we want to take care of our patients as a whole. If something is important to our patients, then it's important to us. They did it in 2018. Yay, Thank you. Thank you. Starting a couple days before Election Day, patients could fill out an application for an absentee ballot. Volunteers then delivered it by hand to the New York Area Election Board where the patient was registered and picked up a ballot. After patients filled out their ballots, volunteers turned them in before polls closed. Please make sure my vote is counted. You know, I went into nursing to make a difference for people. So if I can make a difference, it went, even when it's for one patient, I like to make a difference. This year, more hospitals are taking part, turning beds into voting booths. There are people moving from the city to the suburbs. Something to think about. How might a move like this impact them financially? Joining me right now is Ted Jenkin, the CEO of Oxygen Financial. What additional cost, Ted, should you consider if you want to purchase a bigger home in the suburbs? Well, Jeff, generally if you get a bigger house, you have more space to fill, and that means you have to buy more furniture, more artwork, uh, other things like that, and that can be somewhere between 5 to 10% of your home value. And remember, if you go from 2,000 square feet to 4,000 square feet, you're going to have additional bills like electricity, gas, that will all be higher. And of course, when you have a bigger house and you have land, Jeff, you may have other bills like landscaping and pest control that you may have not had before in an apartment or a condo. But when you talk about Atlanta and you talk about in town versus outside the perimeter, you get these marvelous homes in the suburbs, incredible, you know, wonderful schools, all of that. There is a, a, a great lifestyle to be had. But when it comes down to economics, the escalation of in town and midtown properties as far as homes escalate to a much different tune than what you see in Alpharetta or Roswell or East Cobb. I mean, Jeff, there's no question that over time that urban real estate or real estate inside the perimeter has always far outpaced value wise the growth of what you would get outside the perimeter. This just happens to be the one year, Jeff, that it's sort of flip flop 
where because of COVID, suburban real estate is actually doing a little bit better than urban real estate. In fact, Jeff, recently I saw a townhouse in downtown Alpharetta that was actually priced higher at the same square footage as a home in Chastain Park. You would never see that before. So I think you're seeing an anomaly right now, Jeff, with the coronavirus. And I've lived both in town most of the time here in Atlanta, and I've also lived in suburbia for about 13 years. And I'm often asked, well, which did you like best? And Atlanta's an interesting place in this sense. I like them equally. I mean, there, there's so much up of living in the suburbs and so much up of living in town. You know, it just depends. It's sort of like, uh, it's sort of like beef and chicken. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think it's true of many major metropolitan cities. There are advantages of being in the city of the convenience of restaurants and getting to the theater or the sports stadiums. And in the suburb, you might get more land. You could potentially have public school over private school. All those kinds of issues, I think, go into factors when you think about purchasing a house, especially if you're going to make a big move to the suburbs. So do you like the idea of turning your backyard shed into an office? Is that a good idea? I'll tell you what, I actually think it could be one of the greatest investments right now, especially if you're going to be at home part time or full time, Jeff. You know, it's cheaper than doing a full home renovation because entry level models will start at $10,500 to $12,000. And more importantly, Jeff, you still have to perform at your job if you're going to be working part time or full time from home. And to do that, you might need a place of quiet where you can actually perform at your job. And there's a lot of value to having that. You may be walking out your backyard, Jeff, and across the grass and into the shed, but still, it's a place where you can concentrate on your work. Wow, I really love that idea. I'd like to build a shed and then keep my wife and son in the house, <laughs> and then I'm, I'm living in that shed. I, 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 <laughs> Doesn't sound bad. I hope they don't hear that. Thank you. All right, Ted Jenkin, thank you as always. We appreciate your insight. All right, thanks, Jeff. Sally's moving away, and now we have a new tropical depression that is developing in the southwestern Gulf of Mexico. We're waiting for the latest advisory to come in from the National Hurricane Center. We'll update that track for you coming up. Coming up, the must-see shots from the first round of the U.S. Open had winged foot, including Patrick Reed from Augusta College, from UGA for a while. Ever a controversial figure, but he has some game in that bag. So does Mr. Woods. Just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear on 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, 
the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during prime time. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are well, it's 2020, so you didn't expect that we would be having some more good news for you, did you? And we don't. A nationwide lumber shortage is now driving up prices and putting some projects on hold. Shannon Smith is with our station in Knoxville, WBIR, and she looks at how this is impacting people that are trying to build or expand their homes right now. New construction can be seen all around the area, from commercial and residential complexes to new single-family homes. I've been doing this 47 years. I've never seen anything quite like to today's market. While home builders like Mike Stevens are thriving with new business, they're having to pause some plans because one big component of building is getting hard and expensive to come by lumber. We're out of uh, a lot of two sixes. I've got them on order and had them on order for months and months and uh, we just can't can't get them shipped in. Anderson Lumber Company President Steve Coleman said the lumber shortage started at the beginning of the pandemic and business stopped. But as many started to reopen this spring, a lot of lumber mills didn't. First of May, the plants were still closed. So we had business, but we didn't have any product. Coleman said this is just one factor making lumber scarce. A shortage of trucks and drivers and weather events like hurricanes and the California wildfires are also making the supply low and the demand very high, doubling and sometimes tripling the usual prices of popular lumber products. I'm on my 53rd year and uh, it's some of the highest prices I've ever seen. Stevens advises home builders to get their plans drawn up and foundations laid, especially now that interest rates are at an all time low. But if you can, wait a little longer to buy the lumber. And just because the lumber costs more does not mean the value of the houses anymore. So basically, if, if you're not careful, you can exceed the value of the home quickly. And Along the Gulf Coast tonight, hundreds of thousands of people starting to clear away debris and clean up. 24 hours after the storm ripped apart those communities. Nice little red Mercedes there. The communities from Mississippi through the Florida Panhandle have been struggling. They are familiar with this. They have a lot of cleanup to go. Some very, very heavy rainfall. One of the hardest hit areas was Pensacola, and that is where Jay Gray is taking a closer look tonight. A day later, the scars from Sally run deep across three states. We've been hit really hard and much more than people were prepared for. Survivors clear away and pile up what the storm left behind. Damage from violent winds over 100 miles an hour, more than 24 inches of rain and a storm surge of over eight feet. In some areas, that water still rising. We still have people, you know, trapped in high water out there uh, at this late, late date. So we're going to get some more flat bottom boats in uh, and assist the uh, Army. Uh, you know, the, thank God for the National Guard. The saving grace for Wesley Nielsen was this dock. The boat he lives on slammed into it at the height of the storm. He was still on board. Docks started to disintegrate and boats started to hop over their docks. When I started taking out water, that was time to leave. Across Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida, more than half a million are without power, with line crews pouring in. They stage outside of the threat of the storm in a safe place, and then they'll come in, and they'll stay till every single light is turned back on. But that's going to take some time, just like the recovery here. It just doesn't seem real. I can't believe this is happening. Sally, taking so much from so many, but still unable to tear apart or wash away their resolve. We'll pull out of this, and... Uh... Another month, it'll be all cleaned up and uh, everybody rebuilding and ready for next year. For now, though, most just have to keep their focus on the cleanup and what comes next. 
And we're having some cleanup here too from trees down in our area from the winds in association with what was left of Sally when it moved through. We had a peak wind gust here of 39 miles an hour earlier today. We had more than four inches of rain officially at Hartsfield Jackson as the rain moved through. Now things are drying out as uh, we don't have any more rain here in Metro Atlanta and the remnants of Sally are now up into the Carolinas. No longer a tropical system. Uh, in fact, the National Hurricane Center issued its last advisory on Sally earlier today. It's just an area of low pressure that is now moving up toward the north and east. Still storms possible there along the North Carolina coastline. We did have a couple of tornado warnings along the North Carolina coast earlier, but a lot drier now back here. Now take a look at the rain totals. I want to show you this graphic because it's really similar to what we were showing you yesterday about those rain amounts, how we wouldn't have a lot of rain up in northwest Georgia, and then those rain amounts would gradually get higher as we move into the metro Atlanta area. We had a lot of places we had predicted three to six inches and when you get into this area of the yellows and oranges, that's when you get to the threes to fours to fives and even some areas of six inches. In fact, we have some areas here in metro Atlanta that did pick up six inches of rain in some isolated spots. Sally though is moving out. A cold front's moving in back behind that system. That will give us some nicer weather. We're going to have an opportunity to dry out and then a touch of fall is on the way. Now I know we've been cool this week with them, um, you know, below average temperatures, but that's been because of clouds and rain around. We're going to feel this touch of fall into the weekend. That is because uh, it, that's going to be accompanied by some sunshine. Now watch tonight. Temperatures fall into the mid 60s here to start off the day in the morning. Then we get up to about 81 in the afternoon. Mixture of sunshine and clouds. High temperatures up to about 90 degrees. Let me show you what we're watching with our forecast track. That moisture moving out. We still will have a few clouds around tomorrow mixing in with that sunshine. On Saturday, an east wind picks up. That'll give us a few clouds again with some sun here and there, but not a, you know, a pure sunshine day, but I do think on Sunday we'll have a lot more sunshine around and that's going to be with those cooler temperatures and it'll be feeling pretty nice. Here's the latest tropical depression. Yep, down in the Gulf of Mexico. We just got the latest advisory and I haven't been able to edit this yet. I'm sorry those are on top of each other, but this does show this becoming a hurricane and it's kind of meandering into the Gulf of Mexico. This forecast track is going to be changing a lot over the next few days, so don't take that or take that with a grain of salt what we're seeing right now. There's another system we're watching coming off the coast of Africa a 40 to 50% chance of developing. And then this right here is Teddy. This is a category four storm, a really strong storm. It'll be near Bermuda, we think by uh, next week, but hopefully coming down by the time we um, see that coming near Bermuda and not as a category four anymore. 81 degrees for a high Friday. Then we're into the 70s for the rest of the period with drier weather Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday cooler and no raindrops on that seven day. Julio Jones has a chance Sunday against Dallas to pass former Falcons receiver Roddy White on another list. The franchise's all-time receptions list. He's eight away, had nine catches against the Seahawks. Julio has always had a lot of respect for Roddy, who showed him how to do it in the NFL. Roddy kind of taught me the game early in my career and being able to put up numbers the way he put up numbers and, you know, um, having the ability to surpass him and things like that. It's, it's nothing but love, on, you know, on both ends. Atlanta United has a new designated player to replace P.D. Martinez after the team transferred him to a Saudi club. That's a long road trip. Multiple reports from top soccer reporters say the club will sign Marcelino Marino out of Argentina, an attacker midfielder the team desperately needs help in its offense without Joseph Martinez Atlanta United hopes this is the player who will help direct and create some chances for them first round of the U.S. Open didn't disappoint at Wingfoot one of the great golf courses in the world Patrick Reed from Augusta College one time at UGA long drive on seven did I just read long drive uh, that's a par three and that is in the hole nothing but net uh, Reed finishes tied for second after firing a 66. Tiger Woods, a strong of the putter on 9 and 10 overall, a little bit inconsistent. Three over following a double bogey on 18. Justin Thomas is the leader with a 65, six birdies. Second round coverage beginning at 4 p.m. over on 11 Alive. Let me tell you something. I'm going to catch so much grief from my son and every of the hundreds of guys I played golf with in Atlanta over the years that I called a par three a drive. 
you're only as good as what you read. I'm, I'm like a parrot tonight. The Atlanta dream season <laughs> is over. Man, man, I'll tell you, so, some nights you just want to start over, and this is one of them. Head coach Nikki Collin of the Dream talked about basketball was a tough one this year. I mean, they had to deal with politics and all kinds of issues from uh, Senator Kelly Leffler, one of the team's owners that they virulently disagree with politically. It wasn't pretty, but in the box. The Atlanta Dream are home from Florida earlier than they'd like. I think we were good enough to be playing tonight um, with a chance to go to the semis. But found a cohesiveness inside the WNBA's bubble. Obviously, the stuff that happened with our owner combined with like all the social justice work we wanted to do in the bubble and that forced us to really talk and evaluate you know what our values are the dream narrowly missed the playoffs after a strong finish in Bradenton Florida but most of the headlines seeping out of the bubble were related to the politics of co-owner and senator Kelly Leffler it's the reality is politics are in sports you, you can't say you want them out of sports and then at the same time you know, they're going to promote, you know, Trump helping the Big Ten play. Head coach Nikki Collins supports her players taking a stand in what they believe in, creating a dialogue off the court that in turn improved communication on it. We were dealt uh, one of the most difficult hands in the bubble. Collins had to deal with coaching the players through a public tiff with Leffler, who criticized the league's affiliation with Black Lives Matter and the team declining to play after the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. We got the bonus of having um, ownership issues that, that stung a little deeper. And I think my job in that scenario was to really stand side by side with these guys and a servant leader. Even if that meant challenging a U.S. senator. I have to believe that my ownership group understood that I was in a situation where I was, I was working and living alongside our players. Senator Leffler said she does not plan to sell her shares of the team. As for the team, let's hope they get a little bit better next season. They've got a good core of young players, and they can build on that. We'll take a break. We're back right after this. Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscast, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. 
Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. All right, thank you for watching 11 Alive Prime Time. Switch to 11 Alive now for Up Late. And remember, the news continues all the time right here on the Big 36 online, 11alive.com. Thanks for watching. Have a good night, everybody. See you over in 11 in a couple of minutes. Atlanta Speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel, where you'll find uncut interviews, extended body cam footage, live streams of Atlanta's biggest trials, and more. Subscribe to 11 Alive today. In times of great uncertainty, some things become more clear. The things we take for granted, the people we depend on daily. Here at 11 Alive, we'd like to say thank you. First responders, medical staff, sanitation workers, truck drivers, postal workers, and every brave Georgian doing their part to make a difference. We see you, we hear you, and we appreciate all that you do. Let's start with a viral message going around. Quote, vast majority of people who died had ibuprofen Advil in their system. This message is fake. We just bought 20 dust masks for $97. Are you doing this to help people or are you doing this to make money or both? Both. Take this email sent to the Verify team. Is it safe to have your house cleaned by outside workers? The best practice is to limit guests to emergencies only. We know things are changing every day, but we're here with you. Continuous COVID-19 coverage during primetime. We're committed to giving you facts, not fear. On 11 Alive News Primetime, weeknights from 8 to 11 on WATF. There are everyday actions to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Wash your hands. Avoid close contact with people who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Stay home when you are sick. Cover your cough or sneeze. Clean and disinfect frequently touched objects with household cleaning spray. For more information, visit cdc.gov COVID-19. This message brought to you by the National Association of Broadcasters and this station. Today at noon on 11 Alive. We are seeing that lack of smell or altered taste can be a symptom. We answer your coronavirus related medical questions. Because 11 Alive is where Atlanta speaks. Televised newscasts, not enough for you. Get even more at 11 Alive's YouTube channel.